Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 34th meeting of the Economy Committee. Some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference, and witnesses will be briefing the committee via video conference also. The meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. <coughs> and just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. So moving on then to item number one, um, apologies, we have apologies from John O'Dowd. Um, any other apologies? No, I'm expecting everyone else to share. Yep. Okay. Moving on then to item number two, which is the draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes from last week's meeting of the 30th of September at page four of your pack. Are members content that these are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So moving on then to um, chairperson's business. There is a um, copy of correspondence um, at page 12 of your pack um, from NUS USI um, following our meeting on the 23rd of September where we received correspondence from local students suggesting um, that the necessary precautionary measures implemented by um, the higher education institutions as a response to COVID-19 to reduce face-to-face -face teaching time, etc., mean that fees they charge should be reduced accordingly. The committee um, agreed to reach out to a number of our local universities to gain a response. NES USI has highlighted the impact of the increased numbers of students after A-level results and the COVID-19 restrictions. In addition, they believe education should be free at the point of access and fully pu pu publicly funded. However, with the current model, with students being treated as consumers, it's only right that students have their rights protected when their education is interrupted. Um, we will be having an informal meeting tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, for approximately 45 minutes via Microsoft Teams to discuss the current issues faced by students and higher education providers as a result of COVID-19 with student and lecturer representatives. These include the measures implemented by higher education institutions in response to COVID and the reduction in face-to-face -face time at teaching time and calls from some of the student bodies for reduction in fees. Um, so you will have already received an invitation to the meeting? Yes, Everybody? Chair, and, and I know some members have already accepted that. So just to flag it up again, I will do my usual um, cascade of, of WhatsApps and texts just to to annoy people into attending. Um, also, Chair, I wanted to flag up, we're trying to organise a meeting with the VC and Registrar of Queen's um, at 3.30 tomorrow. Um, so that would probably leave us a bit of a gap and then coming back to meet them. So they've agreed they're available then. I will send out another invitation to members for that. It'll be a separate, uh, separate Teams meeting. Um, but they, they wanted to talk to the committee uh, just about various aspects of what are going, what's going on there. Um, so we will send out an invitation for that, but that would be with the VC and the Registrar. Okay. Um, also, members, at the Chairperson's Liaison Group yesterday, there was discussion in relation to um, external committee meetings. Um, and we are expecting to get some legal advice at the end of this week around yeah. risk assessments. Um, Peters, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, Chair, um, th this has been discussed at, at, at a lot of the, the, the fora we, we used, Clark's, um, CLG, as you've said, and so on. And we, we've reached a very complex situation now where we, we're looking at risk assessments, legal liability, and so on. And I, I think with the, just generally with the issues that are going on with localised lockdowns, with things becoming um, more difficult, um, I, I wanted to, to see if the committee would be content if we postpone our visit programme for the time being so that we can find out essentially what is required, how we implement that, other things we need to do, um, and, and the, the, the reality that visits and external meetings will need to be essential and necessary um, to justify the, the processes that will need to be gone through. So if members are content, we postpone our planned um, visit to the Portadown campus of the Southern Regional College on the 21st until we have a, a great deal more clarity um, as to just exactly how we're meant to approach that. Obviously, we will continue with the briefings we would have had. We can do those over Starleaf. 
but we, we just need to see what the legal advice says, see where the liabilities lie, see what re, uh, risk assessments need to be done, just to ensure everyone's safety. Uh, those we're visiting, and also members and staff and so on as well. So if members are content to do that, we'll come back once we have greater clarity. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, so moving on then to item number four, which is our briefing from Invest NI in terms of the COVID-19 response plan. There is a clerk's memo at page 15 of your packs, a briefing paper, Invest NI update on COVID-19 response and recovery planning at page 18 of your packs, a departmental briefing, COVID-19 additional funding at page 24, and the DFE report, Rebuilding a Stronger Economy, Medium Term Economic Response at page 51 of your pack. So I'd like to welcome to our meeting um, Kevin Holland, who is Chief Executive of Invest NI, and Donald Durkin, who is Executive Director of Outcomes, Value and Impact at Invest NI. So if I hand over to yourselves, um, and you um, can make an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to members to ask some questions. Can you both hear us okay? Yeah, yes, Thank you, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Thank you for the welcome and the introduction. Um, I will just um, share my screen to make sure that works and then um, start off. Can you see a presentation? No. Oh, yes, we can now. Yeah. Let's do full screen. Is that full screen for you? You have a question. Mm -hmm. More or less. Is that yeah, yeah. We can see, yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. So pleased to hear that. So listen, first of all, thank you for um, inviting us back. We were here three months ago, but it's a pleasure to come back and talk again around some of the things that we've been doing over the last few months. Um, as last time, I'd like to take an opening statement. I've got 14 slides and maybe 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have um, time for a long session of Q&A. Um, but there are some things I would like to, um, to share with you to start with. Uh, on the front screen, just wanted to remind everyone that we have um, uh, a lot of information sources for many of the things that we will cover today. Um, the nibusinessinfo.co.uk site that we run, which will really provide most of the um, information to businesses around things that we'll cover. We do have a helpline 0800 181 4422. Uh, so if you're talking to businesses and they're not sure about things, then please feel free to share that. Uh, and then there's a lot of material as well on our investni.com um, website. So let's talk live, but there are many sources for businesses as well to, um, to look at some of the things that we'll talk about today. So first thing is then, um, in summary, when we looked, when we spoke last time, we just finished quarter one of the financial year. It's fair to say the economy was hit pretty hard. I'll show some graphs on the next slide. But since then, if we look at the last three months, then we have seen some businesses which are getting back on their feet, so showing resilience and um, returning to work and resetting what they do. So a lot of what we'll talk about today is around the next bit. You know, how do we recover? How do we get the Northern Irish economy to rebound and be a lot stronger when we look in two years' time, four years' time, six years' time? Uh, so that's what I'd primarily like, um, like to cover. Just to show you the graph though, and it was pretty uh, deep in terms of the, the damage that was done to the economy in the first quarter. I know it seems like a long time ago, but I've included the graphs because the actual, the actual real data, the real export data from the HMRC is not released until September. So although last time we had some of the graphs like on the right hand side showing that services declined and production declined, it's only really recently that we can see that even the rolling exports from Northern Ireland um, reduced by 10% um, in um, quarter one. Um, and for a rolling 12 months to drop by 10%, that must mean a very dramatic drop in an individual quarter. And we see that in the April to June figures of a 30% reduction. Um, so it's not a surprise, and I'm not going to focus on it, but I did want to recognize the impact we had and some of the discussions we had last time around the impact that then has on jobs and the need for furlough um, and the, the risk for employment in the economy. 
We're in um, October now. Um, what I would say is that if we look at some of the indicators, and these are more indicators and surveys of sentiment rather than hard data, um, but it does look like there is some promising shoots of recovery. And last time I think we talked about what could recovery look like? Is it a V? Is it a W? Is it an L? Um, at least in terms of sentiment, we have seen some good signals. And what I would say is that um, your manufacturing has experienced an upturn. There are still questions left out there to say whether is that companies rebuilding stock that they had used during the three months of lockdown where they were producing at a lower rate. So is it just a replenishment or is that a real drive into the economy of recovery? And we can talk about things happening in different places around the world. But the good news is at least the, the shape of the curve has uh, turned. Um, so what can we do to make sure that that upturn becomes real and that we really get as many businesses across Northern Ireland you know, back on their feet and working as we can? Uh, I wanted to share this um, um, summary of um, schemes which are available for all businesses in uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and some schemes will be interesting for some companies and other schemes for others. Um, but there are a lot of the work that is available, used every day, accessible to businesses that can really help businesses survive through these difficult periods. And some of these things, to pick some examples, industrial symbiosis sounds complicated, um, but it's where we help facilitate businesses talking to each other. And sometimes the output of one business is the waste from one business can be useful for another business in creating new products. Um, another example in terms of regional development, we've been supporting uh, the startup for growth and the uh, you know, 16 million pounds of business into local economic development agencies um, supporting 18,000 businesses to go live uh, in the early stages of their development. Other items, a lot of things on innovation vouchers open to many different businesses to help figure out an idea and try and bring it towards market. Uh, and then in trade in the yellow section here, you know, we, we, we are helping a lot of businesses um, across Northern Ireland find out more about markets. So if you want to understand, if you've got a new product and you want to understand what the market is for, I don't know, long life bread in Algeria, we can help you size that market, which is the first step towards doing um, a business plan. Uh, and then in the top left-hand corner, corporate finance solutions, helping business get access to the funding they need to build their investments. So I just wanted to start with that, the, the extensive availability of programs was in place before and is still in place now and can really help us bring Northern Ireland up through that um, V recovery pathway. Um, secondly then is um, um, what do these uh, kind of recovery shoots look like? And I wanted to share a few examples of real work that's happened over the last six months that we've been intensively involved with, um, which is some of the companies who are really driving economic growth through the recovery period. So there's three things on here. Uh, top left-hand corner is a table. And what I'm showing here is the this is the kind of bread and butter work we do with intensive business case work with companies across the region. Um, during the six months to September, we've reviewed and appraised and moved to offer for over a thousand businesses. Uh, this process can be a deep detailed review of a product, a technology, a market, an investment in production, um, a, a skills development program. Um, and then as the culmination of that, when we believe and understand the business plan for a company, we're able to commit to some future investment. In this case, the investments will bring around 220 million pounds into the Northern Irish economy, create 1,500 jobs, and that will give an annual salary bill of um, 53 million pounds, which can then recycle into the economy as those um, salaries are spent on local goods and services. Um, so the business, helping businesses go live has been just as active in the last six months as in a normal six month period um, in Northern Ireland. Uh, some of the companies we mentioned who have been doing some quite extraordinary things, I would say, in the last six months, um, uh, and I've been many of them recently observing good um, sanitation procedures, as you've just been talking about, um, Apple Pet Foods um, announcing expansions, um, Noyeda bringing um, more recruitment into um, cybersecurity and software services. 
Hutamaki, normally they make boxes for McDonald's burgers. I mean, now they're making face masks and uh, helping meet the needs of personal protected equipment uh, across Northern Ireland and, uh, and beyond, as are Prebisol, who are making the kind of disinfectants you need. Um, so I think there's some really interesting businesses doing interesting things at this time. And at least one of the businesses in the, on the screen here has told me that you know, their biggest sales month ever was in June, because there are many businesses who've been negatively impacted by COVID, but also some new consumer demand has created opportunities for others. Um, so we've been working on offers, we've been helping these businesses grow quickly. Uh, and then on the right hand side, just to say we still have a strong pipeline of investment into Northern Ireland. Uh, and I'm very happy that over the last months, we've been able to bring some new um, companies in here, often actually with Northern Irish champions. So people who are living overseas, you know, from Derry, from Fermanagh, um, but um, helping bring their companies to set up in Northern Ireland and selling the benefits of Northern Ireland overseas, which is also something we support through the Northern Ireland um, connections. So I think it's been pipeline and real life examples. Uh, the next thing I wanted to um, take um, a few minutes on this. Um, last time I was here, I talked about the five things that we've had in our plan for a number of years, and that's about job creation, about trade and investment, and around innovation and commercialization. We've been working on that, and then with the Department for Economy Recovery Plan, I think I heard that's in your pack, um, but we've been trying to tie this together to look at, okay, but what is what do recovery actions really look like? And for ourselves, what do we really need to do to help bring the Northern Ireland through this period over the next 12 months, 24 months, three years, and five years? Uh, and what I try to distill that into is the kind of eight key areas that I think are really important that we're gonna focus on as part of the overall recovery plan. Um, so just to go through them. So the first thing for me is the, you know, the, the fastest way towards recovery for many of our businesses is, is through export and external sales. And we, I, th I really think we've got to get a focus on how do we bring money into Northern Ireland quickly. Often the quickest way is to expand your markets to neighboring markets or to an additional market overseas. It's often faster than R&D projects. It's faster than new investment projects or building new factories. So I think when we look at um, um, when we look at recovery, we think, you know, growing external sales, you know, as though the future of our economy depends on it, is something that we're really, really very focused on. Second area is um, innovation. And, um, you know, I think it's really important that we build an obsession with innovation in the, in the Northern Irish culture. I, and I've seen some brilliant examples, some clever, wily, canny people doing some, um, some really cool stuff in the last um, few months. But I do think that we've really got to focus on the, the landscape of funding for innovation and then how do we make sure that our universities, our businesses and our government bodies are collaborating well to try and bring as much of the available funding for innovation into Northern Ireland. Um, you've got to develop new products, new technologies, new business models if we want to be competitive in the, in the future. Uh, the third area is the, um, it's really important for me you know, innovating is not enough. You also want to capture the value from innovation. And the way we do that is entrepreneurship and commercialization. So, you know, I really think, you know, the, the important development here is how can we help businesses be first to market or fastest to market or scale up quickly. We've got some very interesting scale up programs in Invest Northern Ireland. I would love to be able to double them and double them again that brings real growth of the right kind of businesses here. Um, and I think we can help a lot with helping people understand markets, how you build a marketing plan, um, how you segment and how you can target customers. Uh, fourth area is skills and we're, we're, we don't own the space, but we're part of the network that I think is really important. And we're very keen to collaborate with colleges, with councils, with universities and schools to try and do two things. And, one of them is to build the skills that businesses need in the future. Um, so that's let's look at our economic development, look at what the needs are and plan in advance. And then the second thing is help employees with the skills they need today. And I think that's particularly important 
for people who are facing furlough or having to change their role or losing their jobs? How can we quickly look at ways to reskill them? So we're part of the network for that, um, but it's clearly a, a key part of the economic recovery. Uh, then on the right hand side, investments are um, fundamental, and there are three key parts of it that we're looking at. The first is uh, domestic investment. Uh, the majority of the projects we work on are with domestic businesses uh, and helping them invest in growth and expansion. Secondly, it's helping international businesses here to expand their operations, either to a new city or a new location or for the hiring. Uh, and then the third part is um, the key one we talk about often, which is bringing foreign investors into here. And I'll come back to that um, shortly. Uh, the next thing, and we didn't really cover this much last time, but um, we did talk about what are the big leap changes that Northern Ireland can do. And right now, getting into the green economy is just so important for the world and for the environment, but also a real commercial opportunity. So I think making sure we can build a pathway to success in, I don't know whether it's hydrogen or um, Artemis technologies or biomethane or you know, zero carbon flights or zero carbon cows. And, you know, I've seen lots of interesting um, technologies around this. Somehow it's one of those battles that we need to win for Northern Ireland and, and define where is it that NI will succeed best. So I think getting the green economy right is really important. Uh, the seventh thing is um, it's a really big space. So I tried to summarize it in a few words, but there are real opportunities in global supply chains for dual sourcing, second sourcing, and I think now is a very important time for us to do that for Northern Ireland. But to do that, we need to be competitive and we need to improve productivity. And there are some tools that we've launched um, with our partners, um, for example, the Digital 4.0, to help businesses look at what they do and could they do it better digitally, uh, and then assessing their operations to see how they can move to best in class. Uh, and that's really the way to get productivity up uh, and be more competitive. Uh, and then the final thing and the, the kind of platform, the base platform of all of this is, you know, we need the whole of Northern Ireland, the 1.8 million people here and the, the businesses in Northern Ireland. You know, we're very keen on making that, that unit work effectively uh, and make sure that leveling up happens uh, right across the board. Um, for us, a key part of that will be participating actively in the uh, city and growth deals. Uh, and I'll show you some of the examples of that. But we do need to have you know, society, economy, businesses, universities, and government working arm in arm to try and make sure we get the most out of the whole region. Uh, so those are the eight things that I think we'd like to kind of report back on to the Economy Committee over the coming months uh, and even longer than that. Uh, short term, what we've done since we last met is uh, launch a number of um, um, COVID specific schemes. Uh, and there is three of them here. We've got the Digital Selling Capability Grant, which we launched about a month ago, uh, and, the, which was the, and then the COVID Equity Investment Fund, £5 million pound fund um, available for businesses to grow through an investment of up to £700,000. So first one, looking at um, how you can reach new markets or go online to sell things better. And the second one, how can you fund your business more? Uh, then yesterday and this morning, we're launching uh, business and financial planning grants, which will help um, businesses across a wide range of sectors, in science and technology, construction and manufacturing, to take a, take a look at your business now and with professional help from consultants, look at how can we do things differently or better. So that's been only launched um, this morning. It's all on the websites now. And I'd certainly encourage businesses to take a look at that over the coming days uh, and then talk to us around could it work for them or how can it best work? So we've really put a lot of work in designing some robust schemes that pass the value for money test, the government additivity test, and will help businesses through the next period. Uh, and then the bottom left-hand side, just to share with the committee, you know, we're very proud as well that we've been able to deliver a lot of communications on behalf of the executive office. Um, so when we sit for dinner in the evenings, usually I'm listening to Invest MI on the radio, um, talking about outreach to businesses, where can they find help and um, support. So we've launched um, those schemes. Uh, in terms of um, a quick update on the one we mentioned last time, which was the Micro Business Hardship Fund, when we met last time in July, 
we've um, delivered around 12 million pounds to businesses. The scheme closed since then. We've now com almost completed it. We've delivered 23 million pounds to businesses. Um, and there's been around 4,300 applications approved for, uh, for payment. I think there's three left of very complicated ones or five left that um, are still through um, independent assessment. But we've really delivered uh, quite a strong program there. And just to say, I, I mean, from Invest North Melbourne, we, we spent around 3,000 person days on making that program robust and making sure the money gets to the right businesses in the right places and doesn't get um, um, kind of used in the wrong way along the pathway. So that one's been closed. Uh, and then the new ones, we've got digital selling grants. Uh, we've had 30 applications um, so far, and usually we get a big burst at the end. Uh, and the equity fund has got um, four applications in, obviously a much smaller target market. But overall this year, we'll introduce around seven new schemes, and that's the most that Invest Northern Ireland has ever done. It's really been a, a tremendous effort, I think, from the organization over the last six months to put these schemes together, design them, and then get ready to run them smoothly with a, a, a kind of a nice process for the people who want to get into it. Um, so you can go online, check your eligibility, and then only go through all the application process if you're likely to come out at the other end. <clears throat> So let's look at um, Northern Ireland now in terms of our international position. What I would say is that our, our proposition is still really strong, actually. And when, when we talk, when I talk to foreign companies and foreign investors, then you know, we, we, we've demonstrated a lot of our strengths during this period. But we have, as Invest Northern Ireland, we have had to adapt uh, and change the way we operate um, because of the type of travel restrictions and the changes in the economy. Um, two of the areas we've looked at um, and changed have been first in exports. Um, so we are, we've moved to virtual business development e events, and you can see we've done um, 60 of them. So we can do things like bringing um, virtual roundtables of companies in Dubai together to talk about education and bringing in the Northern Irish expert companies into that space. So we can create virtual roundtables for people to, um, to interact. We can do it because we have a team in Dubai who can react and interface and still meet people locally. And so we can benefit from the face-to-face, -face, even if the Northern Irish companies are not able to be physically present in the room. And I think that's shown itself to be really powerful. Um, so we've been looking at virtual business development events. Uh, we've been helping connect business leads to market expertise. So what is the... Um, potential in different markets and how can you understand it. Uh, the fifth point there is um, from the kind of, from these wide interactions, we're able to then help specific businesses with research projects. So we've helped a business, for example, look at the US market in a particular sector and help them find target companies. And even in some cases, do some cold calling for them to really see whether those potential targets are are, are um, real targets in reality. Um, so I think this kind of connection of a, little, a real life in country, um, virtual workshops through um, kind of live round tables, and then follow up action plans in market are really showing that we can still do strong export work for businesses during this period. Uh, and given that companies can't travel, I think it's even more important. Um, we're also um, representing companies live. so. We have started doing live trade shows. They have started again in some countries, like in China. So although it's very hard to get to China at the moment, what my local team can do, both in Mandarin and in English, is run the stand. So we can build the stand, be present at the trade show, um, and represent companies through the information they provide to us. So I think it's a very powerful example of what we can do overseas for, um, for businesses. Uh, and then with regard to investment, I talked about domestic investment earlier, but we've clearly been very active in, I think, quite a noisy space at the moment, trying to make sure that Northern Ireland um, message around our attractiveness as an investment location is still out there. And um, so we've done a lot of um, digital promotion, 20,000 outreach events. Uh, we've got 37 virtual events, the same type of thing where we invite investors into a virtual workshop to talk about what we do. And we are curating online meetings with investors. So first we have to find them, that's lead generation. 
then we have to do lead conversion where we're starting to bring potential investors to hear more about what we do. Um, and then the final stage at the bottom of the, um, of the of the slide here is once you've got a lead and you've converted it, normally we would bring people here to show them what we have real life. Clearly we can't do that now with two weeks quarantine rules and difficulties traveling. Uh, we've had, we have found a pretty effective system of doing virtual visits. And I was looking at one of the programs yesterday. So we can do a visit where an investor can over two days do what he would do real life. Then you would meet a council representative and meet a business and meet um, um, a, 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 a business in a related area, spend time with ourselves, meet our property team. So we can do a two day schedule for someone, but it's all done virtually now. Um, and I think that's really important that we keep this whole pipeline moving during this um, um, period where we're restricted from travel. But the evidence so far that it works and that we have a strong pipeline still for the future. Um, moving to um, kind of next area that we may cover today is um, 84 days to go to the 1st of January, um, which is the new world of how we interface with the European Union and then also other countries around the world. I wanted to share some of the things that we're doing. On the left-hand side, um, we have put together again an update to the um, European Exit Resilience Tool. And this is something a lot of businesses are using as a self-diagnostic about, God, what, I don't understand this, what do I need to do and who can help me prepare? So you can go into a system which is quite robust and go through strategy, operations, innovation, marketing, finance, compliance, key one, and then people and skills and data uh, and figure out what are the things we need to do. Now, I know there's still a lot of lack of clarity. I think we're all aware of that. Um, so we know there will be more information to put into these different um, systems going forward, but you can do preparation based on the known and then start to prepare for the unknown. Uh, and we're helping people to do that as well as running the, um, the grant scheme. We have, we spent three and a, well, we've um, given three and a half million pounds of Brexit preparation grants. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we're trying to give better access for, to information to people. So in the future, we've got um, webinars planned on supply chain logistics, customs and taxation, really complicated area. But, um, and you can see that's quite a long session uh, and then preparing for EU change. So in the past, we ran live workshops. Um, now we're running webinar workshops and giving deep dives. And in some ways, the benefit is the previous ones are available online. So we're able to deliver a lot of online training um, for Brexit um, preparation. And then we will build into that in the future preparation for the future free trade agreements. So we've certainly been preparing for that. Uh, I wanted to dedicate a slide to one of the aspects of um, leaving the European Union that I think is fundamentally important. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, innovation really is important any time for a business and for a region. It's even more important in a time of volatility. Um, we are concerned around the, la the loss of the European funding mechanisms. Um, we've been able to have access to around £200 million pounds worth of R&D investment through the grant for R&D over the last um, period of the European Union scheme. Uh, that's been able to bring around £850 million pounds into the Northern Irish economy and generate innovation and R&D development. Um, similarly, for the local economic development schemes, we've been able to support councils in their work uh, and then access to funding, provide financing available to, um, to businesses. Um, so from our side, we've certainly been engaging with um, bodies in, the, um, in Westminster to try and make sure that there is a replacement for, um, for ERDF, uh, particularly for grants for R&D. And I know First Minister, Deputy First Minister, Minister for the Economy, and then I saw Minister of Finance yesterday was also working with all administrations for the same goal. But I would like to highlight for me, it's really, really important that we continue to fund that um, so that we improve the competitiveness, the innovation and the productivity of uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think the good news is that there is um, a lot of additional funding that is being planned. So UKRI, which is the main a research and innovation body in the UK will have significantly increased funds. So I think there are two things to do. One is to try and find replacements for some of these European funding, 
but also as a group, um, try and make sure we get um, we understand the other funding mechanisms and how we can use them. Uh, and certainly, you know, after this call, we've got a session with the university vice chancellors um, to talk about how can we collectively make sure we get that. Uh, and the last comment on here is, um, you know, that I know we're going through comprehensive spending reviews. We're also trying to manage our optimize our budget for this year. The projects we do with businesses are multi-year projects, and the more we move towards multi-year. The visibility of the funding will have the more effective that we can be in driving economic um, growth. Um, so that's uh, two two more slides to cover, and then I'll kind of hand over for Q and A. I wanted to talk about um, city and growth deals um, because I get asked about them a lot when I'm travelling around the, the region. You know, from my side, I recognise that government funding is going to be tight in the coming years. We know that there's 1.3 billion pounds of commitment to the city and growth deal projects. So for Invest Northern Ireland, you know, we really want to be front and centre in making these projects deliver commercial outcomes. Um, and I think we've got a very key role to play in that. Um, we are very active and have been very active in the six months of lockdown and, and eased restrictions, working with Derry and Strabane on Carl and on Cedra. Uh, looking at what the medical school can bring and how that connects to the other um, medical related projects in the region. Uh, we've been working with the Mid South uh, West region, uh, looking at what the manufacturing component of the um, economic strategy can be. I was able to join the launch uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, for, for that project. Um, for Causeway, then we're feeding into the digital part of their review as they prepare that. Um, and then for Belfast, you know, our team have been deeply, deeply involved in these in the uh, appraisal documents, looking at technology, businesses, um, and how those projects can go forward. So I just want to share with the committee, we, we're really, really keen on these projects and what we can do to help um, drive them forward. And we're moving from, I think, a little bit arm's length appraisal to kind of commercial leadership and connecting businesses into these uh, projects. So finally, then, to, to wrap up, um, you know, Q1 was difficult. I think Q2, we saw some good um, shoots of recovery. Um, we've got our eight elements of um, the future that uh, we believe will help. Um, uh, these are the actions that we can take with others to help drive the, uh, the economic recovery. Um, and in particular, you know, I, I kind of recognize that we've got to work in the partnership together to do it because the challenge facing us is bigger than any one of us individually. But I really believe that collectively we can be very powerful and make uh, you know, the Northern Ireland that comes out of COVID and starts January 2021 in this new economic environment. You know, a, a, on, we can set it off on a powerful platform for the for the future, and I'm very happy to be leading Invest Northern Ireland um, to do that. So thank you, Chair. And thank you very much for that, Kevin. It was a a, a very comprehensive briefing. Um, and obviously there's a great deal of activity going on within Invest in terms of economic recovery and um, supporting businesses through this period and, and as we look forward to, to Brexit. Um, and obviously the role of Invest is going to be core to the economic recovery. Um, and our role, I suppose, as a committee is to, to both scrutinise and support the work of um, both the department and its arm's length bodies. And, and a concern that, that I have in, in relation to invest is that at times it seems a bit nebulous, a bit more than arm's length, um, and we don't have a great deal of information about what is shaping all of the programmes that, that you are putting forward. And, and they're very comprehensive programmes. And, like there's not an awful lot that I would disagree with in terms of you know the eight drivers for recovery actions, but in terms of the 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 business surveys and the research and and the information that is actually used to develop those programs, um, is there more detail of that that you can share with us as a committee um, and how it is aligning with the the work of the department in terms of policy objectives in relation to economic recovery and are you feeding in to the, the department's um, recovery strategy planning um, and the, the documents that have already been produced, have you fed into those? Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. So let me, let me answer a couple of different elements of that. First one is um, uh, in terms of kind of information to the committee, um, I, I'm kind of very happy with um, open access to the kind of information 
business surveys, um, outreach that we do. Uh, and what we do on a kind of weekly basis or twice weekly basis, for example, is looking at the number of um, companies within our intensive pool that we really know well. You know, how many people have been on furlough? What is the outlook for them moving off furlough and into um, jobs again? Um, how does that break down by sector and by region? Um, and um, we, we, we certainly share that with the department. It goes up to the executive office. And if we need to create a mechanism for that to go to the economy committee as well, we're happy to do that. It is public information. We have actually expanded our um, sharing out of that information. So we do share it with the, the business um, uh, organizations, with the chambers, with the, uh, the different um, bodies who support different sectors of the, um, of the business community. Uh, councils, we certainly give it to. Sometimes we present it to them. Sometimes we send it to them. But very open to kind of sharing that. And if, if there's something that we're not including you on, then we should fix that because that's, a, that's um, an easy one. I, I would also, I was thinking about it this morning, we do do a twice weekly newsletter as well. And I, I just want to make sure that we do a check as well to make sure that the members of the committee, if you're not on it, we can check whether you're on it to make sure that you get that kind of outreach because it is a good barometer for things that are happening in the, in the economy with announcements and jobs and technology. The other thing I think for you is, elected members as well as it does tell you when a scheme is open you know so for example when does the new innovation voucher scheme open and when would your businesses have to apply or things like this morning i know that pre-propel which is one of the startup business schemes it's open it's good if your businesses know so uh, we will do a quick check to make sure you're seeing some of those things if you're not today i can't put you on i think because gdpr i think you have to ask us to but um, we'll always know how to do that uh, and then your other comment around, do we feed into the Department of the Economy? So we give um, the information we have to the Department for the Economy when we collect or when we summarize or when we analyze what's happening in the business world. Uh, and we do that through various briefing documents or live presentations to them. Uh, these eight um, uh, drivers of the economy, we've provided well, to them and then on to you for the Economy Committee um, briefing. Uh, and then equally um, for, I think there was some outreach on programme for government preparation. And certainly for me, I'd love to see some of these things in the future programme for government, particularly innovation. I think it needs to be a, personally, I think it needs to be a, a separate theme in there. It's so fundamentally important. Um, so we do, do, we do give that input in terms of um, suggestions to the department. For the schemes themselves, um, we've been quite creative and quite open-minded through the last six months. Uh, we made our first proposals to the department on the 20th of March, you know, some quite substantive suggestions for what could help drive the economy. Uh, and then through the round one of these round two of bids, June monitoring, October monitoring, you know, we've been providing kind of options for the department to consider for things that can help the economy. And then sometimes we win them and we get funding for it, and sometimes we don't win it and don't get funding for it. I mean, in the end, we recognize the policy decisions that are taken by department and then through to the executive. Uh, but we do make a lot of um, kind of proposals. Um, and I'm happy to talk some more about the overall shape of those more frequently with the committee, if that's um, helpful. Uh, and certainly sometimes I think we count on your support as well from the different um, kind of elements of the committee to help get funding for the projects which will make a difference. Yeah, I think that where you've ended there is, is a key point to it because as a committee we're very keen to to listen um, to what various sectors across the, the economy are, are telling us um, because obviously they are those that are, are most <coughs> equipped in terms of, of shaping um, some of, of what is required and it, it would equip us uh, better to um, be able to communicate that with the department and to support that work. Um, and it, therefore, if there's information that you can share with us that is going to enable us to be able to do with that, then that, that would be very much welcome. I, I think it is. It would be very useful if, there, if those briefings that you, you talked about could be shared with the committee, um, because we, we want to play a very active role in that. And last time that you were in with us, you in at the beginning of July, you had outlined that at that point, I think that you had been awarded, I think it was 32 million or in the region of 32 million um, and had made um, 
22 bids, I think, across a number of categories. And you had said at that point there was seven or eight projects that were going to come live over the end of the summer and into um, the beginning of September. And, and uh, I recognise that there is three or four of them there that have done. Is there more information that you can share with us in relation to those other bids that um, are that have been made or have been awarded? Yeah, so the three of the three of the seven have been launched you know, two a month ago, then um, one today. Um, some of the other areas that we're looking at are things like kind of operate. You know, how can we help businesses with operational improvements? You know, so many companies are changing what they do or trying to do it better. And we will be introducing a scheme in the coming between now and the end of the year. The four will all go live, um, helping businesses change and improve their operations. Um, doing some things around productive grants for um, for new projects and uh, how can we support businesses to make the right kind of investments. Uh, we'll be looking at kind of helping specific one or two specific sectors do much deeper dive in, you know, how do we fix the challenge that this sector has got, um, sorry, this sector is, is facing. Um, so those are the kind of things that we'll be um, introducing over the, ne over the next year. We, we, we don't kind of, we, we let them be announced when they're finalized and kind of robust and ready for launch. Um, but those are the shape of what we'll be bringing forward. Okay. Um, and then I guess just that, that brings me to the, the same point. I guess the, the, the shaping of those is something that obviously is really important to, to economic recovery. Yeah. And when we had the department in with us, we, we did ask them about the bids that they had made and how they align with the, the economic um, recovery strategy that um, the department has um, published and I, I think it would be very useful if we could see something similar from yourselves as to how the bids that, that you are making um, link in directly with the, the recovery strategy because I think it is really important that these things join up um, and I'm just uh, one final question from myself before I hand over to, to the um, other members is in relation to that Brexit pre preparedness um, we have a document in our uh, packs this week from the, the business, the Brexit business working group that I never get the name right. Um, and like one of the things that they are flagging up is still that lack of support in terms of preparation. Um, so I know that you have highlighted there at the end of, of your presentation the work that Invest is doing in that space, but is there further programmes that are intended before the end of the year and after the end of the year once we we know um what the the situation that we are likely to be in is um that are going to to equip businesses to both prepare for that new um arrangements but also to recover from from covid do you want me to pick that yeah. up yeah, sure Sorry, um, sorry, I mean, just in, in, in terms of, of Brexit, as, as Kevin has rightly said, both with on NI Business Info and uh, on investni.com, there is a lot of information um, and we've broken it down into specific areas for businesses. Um, so there's lots of frequently asked questions that, that as you say, we, we, we engage with businesses, we do lots of surveys, we have, we have lots of, of webinars and online assessments been done and all of that information feeds back to what businesses are actually looking for us to provide. So with on uh, those sites, you will see things like the 10 key things that businesses can do now, even though there's still some uncertainty. Um, as Kevin has rightly said, we, we've run um, five online webinars um, to date with another four planned, um, and they will run um, during October. Uh, and again, what we'll do, Chair, is we, we will continue to revise um, the webinars and the information that we have as the information comes through from the negotiations and from the, the, uh, the Joint Committee. As Kevin has also said, we've also updated the EU exit resilience tool. So that's now uh, reflecting the current position in relation to Brexit and also takes into consideration COVID-19 issues. Um, and that's online um, and companies, it takes them 15 minutes to complete 28 questions and they get a report um, digitally uh, uh, as soon as they finish, finish the report. And what we do is we get access to the overall information. So again, what that does is help us to determine what support and advice and guidance we can put in place. So that's an ongoing rolling process. And Donald, just um, to, to vary, any business is able to access that or is it yes. only clients? Oh, oh, no, that, that is, that's open to all businesses across Northern Ireland. Um, so no, you don't have to be in support or, or, or in receipt of invest and I support. That's open to everyone. And, and we have had um, businesses that haven't previously received financial support from Invest NI 
uh, are, are using the tool. Those, those businesses, Chair, uh, are also freely available to join um, the webinars. There, there's no charge. It's open access. Um, and the events that Kevin has referred to that we're running in October, we'll have specialist speakers at those events. We'll also have an opportunity for one-to-one -one appointments, online appointments. Um, that's open to all as well. And there'll also be an online virtual exhibition area. So business organizations and other related bodies will be able to showcase what advice and guidance they can give to businesses as well. That's all freely available to all businesses across Northern Ireland. Okay. Thanks for that, Donal. Um, Stuart. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your, your presentation. It's been very helpful in, in these very difficult times, and don't underestimate the challenges that you and, and the businesses that you work with have. Can I take you back to um, your delivery of the £40 million Northern Ireland Micro Business Hardship Fund? Uh, and firstly, um, you only spent £23 million of that £40 uh, supporting uh, some for just over 4,000 businesses. Why, uh, again, and the question will be repeatedly asked until we get a decent and reasonable answer and indeed actual practical support, why did so many businesses fall through the cracks in relation to this? Why are there so many businesses in Northern Ireland, small and micro businesses, that have been excluded um, either by this fund or other funds which the department has administered? That's question one. I have a couple of other questions, but maybe you'd like to address that first. Yeah. So let, let me um, let me let me comment on that. So the um, the so we we launched the micro business hardship fund. I, I know. I mean the, the the inclusion and exclusion criteria for that are defined by the policy you know, with the delivery arm for 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 doing that. I, I know that they did some pretty extensive work around given the funding you've got. You know, how far can you go and how deep can you go and which type of companies are, are included in it. Um, I know they looked at the kind of the Welsh scheme and the Scottish schemes and schemes from, di from different regions um, in, in the design of that um, in the design of that program. And I think when the when the conclusion came out, the percentage of businesses when you compare it to Wales or someone who, or, or different regions is, is quite similar to, um, um, to, to Northern Ireland. But it's true that not every business in Northern Ireland has got access to, to funding. Um, and I think that's the capacity of available funding relative to the number of businesses which are here. But the profile of small and micro businesses in Northern Ireland is very different from the profile in Scotland and Wales. So we're not comparing uh, apples with apples, you're actually comparing apples with oranges. Um, is there any chance of revisiting a, a, a similar scheme like this? Um, and what, if anything, is Invest NI going to do? I appreciate your, your, your large-scale global activities, and they are important, but what is particularly important are those businesses which simply will not exist in a few months' time in Northern Ireland. Businesses that people have invested their savings, their ingenuity, uh, and, and, and their activity in over the last uh, number of years to get set up. So um, I, I, I understand the, the request, and I've heard it, and I believe there was some discussion in the assembly a few weeks ago on the on the same question. Um, and I, I know that kind of the policy makers will have to review in detail, you know, what happens next um, for different businesses. Where we can help is with the schemes that we have for businesses. But you know, if that can find innovation or new markets or something like that, um, if it's a kind of grant funding scheme. You know, we helped with the micro business hardship scheme. We delivered it robustly, um, but we, we don't control the funding for any potential future schemes or policy decisions, either from the executive or further down. Changing the subject slightly, today there was a, a UK wide report which said that the uh, UK government business loans uh, to assist companies with. with um, the difficulties around uh, the pandemic, that early analysis has demonstrated that there will be a very high failure rate in respect of these loans and the inability for businesses to repay them. Can you tell us what, ex what the extent of that will be in Northern Ireland, what you expect the failure rate to be in Northern Ireland, and what, if any, activity the department or yourselves will be taking to support those businesses for whom the banks will undoubtedly be pursuing in the not-too-distant future? 
So, so when I, you know, we, we've we've had some. We, we don't run those the the, the loan schemes, the B bills, and the C bills, and the CL bills. Okay. And I have seen I have seen the same reports around um, kind of long term viability. Um, and I know that some of the extensions which have been given to those loans do help businesses who would have faced a, perhaps a February 2021 cash crunch to to move things um, a little bit further. Um, but I think the main things that we can do are try and help the kind of businesses help businesses grow and generate local economic growth. And a lot of that is getting the businesses who are operating in Northern Ireland, where there is an opportunity to expand and to grow, to, to do that. And then you can help stimulate the local economy and the kind of the network of suppliers who are around them uh, to be able to do that. Uh, I think the kind of the big loan schemes, the I think what did Rishi Sunak give, was it 50, over 50 billion or 60 billion of schemes? Clearly the kind of muscle and firepower for that is something which would be taken at a, a UK level rather than a, a Ireland level. What we can do is work with businesses, you know, during this period between now and loan repayment schedules to try and help them, you know, find markets and operate more efficiently and um, use their resources in the best way. Um, so we can work on a business level in the meantime, but we're not we're not a lender of last resort for a large number of businesses in the, in Northern Ireland. Yeah, we do we do have the far, the firepower for that. Finally, um, Chair, um, you, you you made reference to um, what you see as business confidence in Northern Ireland. Yet a few weeks ago in the committee, um, two eminent economists uh, perhaps painted a substantially more gloomy picture for the committee. Uh, on what basis do you build your uh, business confidence outlook for Northern Ireland? So I, I talk to a lot of businesses and I visit a lot of businesses and I have seen, you know, like the examples we looked at here, you know, I, I see that there are areas of opportunity and I see some businesses being really successful. So, um, you know, it, it's based on kind of re real life um, experience and then, you know, every month we commission the the ims um, surveys which talk to businesses and do a, a broader um statistic it's not statistical really because it's not quantitative and validated but it is to a broad group around are you more confident or less confident than before and those graphs like those v's that <coughs> i showed on the um the early slides those that, that's the feedback we get that's the barometer we get from businesses so it is more optimistic i, I think in general economists tend to look at risk and have a more gloomy view of the world than business people who are looking for opportunity and success. So that there's maybe a kind of cultural bias there as well. Yeah. Let, let me just pick on up on that. Uh, two years ago. Just, just in, in terms of, um, I, I know Richard Ramsey was at the committee a couple of weeks ago um, and, and runs the Purchasing Managers Index across Northern Ireland. What Kevin's referring to is uh, we, we do that with a cohort of businesses that have been supported by Invest NI. So that, that's a, a smaller number, but it still equates to about 250 businesses that we do that purchasing managers index um, each month. And again, just to the former, to the chair's question before, that information is shared up with, uh, with colleagues in the Department for the Economy as well. It, it's an indicator uh, of confidence uh, moving forward, uh, as Kevin said, rather than simply being um, a look back, it's a look forward. You appreciate that it's sometimes difficult for people to understand your your glass half full as opposed to others' glass half empty concept. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I understand. And we have to we have to make ourselves right. I think. Okay, thank you, um, John Stewart. Can we bring John into the spotlight, please? Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, yeah, we can indeed. Yeah, Kevin, Donald, thank you very much for your presentation and for the work that you continue to do and uh, also the advice and assistance you're giving through the NI Business website, for example. I know that has been invaluable to many businesses above and beyond the financial assistance and whatnot that they're getting. Um, you, like all of us, will be obviously very aware of the stark figures predicted for job losses in Northern Ireland, potentially over 100,000 this year. And while hopefully many of those come back in the round as the economy starts to rebuild, many have been predicted to be lost forever. Um, you give some good news stories and it is positive to hear those success stories coming out of not just FDI but indigenous businesses that are adapting in the current climate. Can you give any sort of prediction based on what you're seeing and the investment and the growth 
as to what level of job rebuilding and new creations of jobs we can see in the short, medium and long term, because it feels at the moment looking forward that those 100,000 jobs will be difficult to replace in the current climate, definitely in the short and medium term. So I'm just interested to see how quickly that can be done and what sectors that can be done in. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. And I mean, I, you know, I've seen the projections of the, the 100,000 potential job losses as well. And I mean, it's a terrifying number is the honest answer, because um, if you look at the, if you look at the last four year plan that we've been working on, which ends at the end of March, and, I, and we reported on it uh, I think at the last committee, you know, our goal was to grow 20, between 20 and 30,000 jobs over a four year period. So, and I know how much work, you know, activity schemes, funding goes into that. So if we look at a, if there were an incremental 100,000 job losses, I mean, it is a substantive task to be able to um, to replace that. And um, so I think then we need to look um, at some of the kind of sectors and what are the uh, sector by sector, what can we do differently? And I think that bit's still work to be done. There are clearly some kind of sectors that will have real challenges in aerospace is one of them very important for Northern Ireland People don't fly anymore. I mean, none of us have been on a plane or more than one plane for the last six months, whereas normally we would probably, even in this room, have taken 30 or 40 flights. So, you know, how do we help solve that? I think some of the jobs will be saved by doing some interesting R&D projects and looking at the future of zero carbon flights and things like that. So protect the skills, protect the technology, protect some of the roles. Um, and then how can we help businesses like that do something different? So. For us, it's, if you look at aerospace, for example, they're, they're good at um, high quality manufacturing, zero defect manufacturing. They understand composites, they understand um, um, lightweight materials, they understand sensors, they understand feedback loops. So are there opportunities for those companies in adjacent sectors, like in precision engineering or medical devices or diagnostics and some of the, centers, some of the sectors which are really growing? And I think there, there's a real joint work to do with Bayes in the UK, who are, I think, experts in understanding industry sectors, and then ourselves in Northern Ireland who understand what happens here, and just see if we can help some of these businesses pivot from their past to a future that can recreate employment quickly. But I mean, I, I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge, uh, and I know that Many of the jobs that we've introduced this year, which I'm very happy about, they target certain groups of people with a certain skill set. We can help build those skill sets through conversion courses, access to technology development, skills for individuals. In the, and I think being able to put together with the colleges and universities, you know, conversion courses for skills is also going to be a key element to get people back to work um, quickly. Just to add, add to that, John, it's some of the information we will share in terms of Kevin said earlier about uh, we do a furlough analysis bulletin uh, twice a week, and that's engaging um, across 2,500 businesses in terms of where they are um, with, with people on furlough. At, at, at the height, um, there was somewhere in the region of 43,000 employees on furlough, and 27,000 of those and businesses that we've been engaging with are now, are now back um, are, are potentially back in, in active employment. The two sectors that were most adversely affected were advanced manufacturing and engineering um, and construction. And both of those are sitting around between 65 and 70% of their workforce is, is back in again. So as Kevin says, we, we do all the detailed analysis um, with the companies. We, we spend over 1,800 hours doing surveys with the businesses back in May and June. And lots of what we're actually doing now in terms of the schemes is actually trying to put those specific areas of support in place in order to help those businesses um, get back in, into uh, their markets quickly. Some of them are looking at new markets, as Kevin has said, and some of them are about repurposing what, what they are doing. We have lots of companies that have repurposed from traditional industries into, for example, PPE, given the, the current crisis. And a lot of what we're doing in terms of innovation and support is helping those businesses make, make those moves. So, so we're constantly reviewing um, sectors and businesses that are adversely affected. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do is to put bespoke programs and support in place in order to help those businesses and those sectors grow and come back to where they were pre-COVID. Okay, thanks for that, um, Kevin and Donald. I mean, obviously, we, we, we really all hope that those figures are nowhere near the levels predicted. Um, but given that economists were talking about a three to four year potential recovery, 
um, you know, what, even what you're talking about in terms of job creation originally planned before COVID of 25,000 over a four year time, it could take many more years than that for many of these jobs to be replaced and that is deeply concerning. And sure. one of the aspects given that, that the Northern Ireland is an SME economy with over 90% of our businesses being micro, small or medium sized, um, do you think there's enough money being directed at, at all levels to support startups, um, especially maybe those who are losing their job from certain sectors? We look at the, the Nortel effect, for example, when Nortel shut, a lot of new tech companies opened on the back of that and they used in the field of startup business programs. Do you think there's enough support and funding in there to give those new entrepreneurs the support they need at this time? So, so I, I mean, I've seen some of the, the programs that have really worked, the, you know, like the scaling programs that we work on, uh, and then some of the kind of go for it. So you've got go for it, which helps the first bit, and then some of the scaling, which works a little bit later in the cycle of business. I mean, I think we, I think the more we can do for good business ideas, the better. So if there, if we can, if we can find, if we can find incremental funding. I'm sure that we can find businesses with incremental good ideas. So I'd certainly support you know, further investment in that space. And I think it will make a difference. I think they can create, create jobs and, and innovation and just doing things differently. So um, yeah, I would certainly support that. Uh, and then make sure that we invest in the whole ecosystem so that universities are able to do spin outs and do tech transfer and move things from technology to market more quickly. Yeah, I, I do think kind of further investment would be useful. And I am concerned that things like, you know, as the European funding, if it moves away from our ability to support the local economic development, then there's a risk there's less funding rather than more. Okay. Um, just one final thing, Chair, and I'll, I'll let you move on then. Um, I'm glad you touched on the city deal. And I think that could be, well, undoubtedly be a massive economic driver across Northern Ireland and help the play to regional balance, for example, given the spread of the money around the country. Um, some of us were fearful that there might be delays around COVID, but I'm encouraged by what you're saying from your input in that, that that's not going to be the case. Can you give an idea of a time frame when we'll see economic recovery actually starting to take place and schemes rolling out on the back of that financial assistance? For, for the from the city growth deals? Yes. Yeah. So I think the, I mean, they're all working through, I mean, the, the, the appraisal pra process is really deep and intensive. Um, they move from outline business case to strategic business case to full business case to go live. So there is a timetable, and it does take um, uh, it does take you've got to get to the end before you're allowed to put funding in. I think what useful is at the same time some of the projects are moving anyway. Um, so some of the things on clinical trials which are being done, and some of the developments in life sciences related projects happen already. Uh, and you can actually start getting commercial impact from some of the academic work that's done from it. But in reality, I think the kind of donor probably has a better idea, but I think that the, the, when, when is the first 50 million pounds that goes into a city and growth deal project? Probably not before the end of the next year, actually, yeah. I would say. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah, well, it, it's I mean, it, it's right, John, because they're they are capital projects. But but just again, to give you an overview of, of the level of engagements, um, currently as as we speak, there there is a workshop ongoing, um, on the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Centre, um, outline business case at the moment. So there's a team of people from Queens, from the DFE, from Invest NI, and from Innovate UK, uh, along with the actual pro project proposer. So that that's that's ongoing. We had one. On Monday morning on Irish and last Thursday on GII, um, our, our team uh, through Alan McKeown, our regional business director, is engaging with colleagues in Derry City Council on, on the Derry uh, City and Strabane deal. Um, I have a meeting with Stephen Gillespie and his colleagues next Monday in terms of how Invest and I can, can help and support. And through Alan McKeown, Ethna McNamee is working with Mid South West in terms of developing their projects. So, uh, yes, Kevin's right. Because of the capital nature of the projects, it takes time for the money to move. But there are lots of innovative and developmental projects that can happen um, in the interim. They, they don't stand still. Um, and, and our team, which includes our innovation executives, our client executives, our foreign direct investment managers, are all working collectively with those projects in, in terms of how can we maximize um, the commercial outturn and the economic development proposals coming from those projects. And the other critical element is about how, how can we make sure that we align all the various specialism and skills across the various dates because advanced manufacturing and um, data analytics um, are, are, are evident in a number of the different days. We want to make sure that we have 
a collective uh, strong case going forward in terms of those solutions, but they are pretty fundamental in terms of economic recovery and future growth. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, one thing I'd love to see, this is a finish point, is given those capital schemes that potentially by then we've developed the Northern Ireland first procurement process, so there's Northern Ireland businesses and indigenous businesses that are benefiting from that support to keep the money in-house, but that's a discussion for another time. But thank you for your time, guys. Thank, thank you. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Kevin and Donald, for your presentation and briefing so far. And um, I like with the chair, I, I agree with the chair. Uh, I don't think you can see any problems with any of those eight drivers and those eight um, actions. Is it's really a matter of of making sure that they work and they're coordinated well together. I just want to probably uh, speak on about three of them. First of all, I, I, the skills, uh, and I appreciate. Kevin, that you said you're you're not in the the main player here in relation to skills, but obviously you're very key. Um, it's important that um, that the skills deficits are recognised uh, and addressed in order for us to grow our economy. Which skill deficits are you currently recognising that are the main priorities? So I would say that um, if I first thing is if I look at all the, the businesses where we've been kind of announcing new jobs and announcing investment, if you look over the last um, six to twelve months, a lot of it has been you know software, it's been cyber, it's been um, um, artificial intelligence, it's been um, data management, data analytics. You know, so they are those kind of skills are really important. When we talk to the companies, there's always a balance that. You, you, Companies will support other companies when they're here, but don't want to see too many companies coming in a single sector, which creates too much demand for a single skill set. And then there is a lack of resource in that skill set. So there's always a balance with them. But you know, I think um, I think we're as long as we plan ahead with the skills academies and the universities. Um, we're able to provide the kind of pipeline of skills in that kind of sector that will still continue to attract companies. And I think it's a really useful area because you can do it with new graduates, you can do it with people who are not graduates who are you know, kind of straight fresh out of school, and you can also do it in retraining and conversion courses for people who've worked for 10 years in a company with some skills but can pivot towards these kind of jobs. And I think that's probably the key one for me. I know there's various manufacturing things we've discussed in welding and things like that as well, but you know, I think those digital skills are probably the most important thing for us right now. And do you believe that your work um, uh, with all the agencies that are involved in this and with the higher education and further education is is adequate in order for, for you know, are those relationships good and you feeding into uh, those bodies on a, uh, you know, and how do you feed into them? So, so we have um, we have conversations with them. So, I mean, I've got you know after this call, I'm with two of the universities for an hour to talk about what do we do next and how do we plan innovation funding. And we've got a section on skills actually with the universities. Uh, then next Friday morning, I'm with um, Paul Bartholomew from, from from your part of the world to talk about what's Ulster University doing. And then next week, I've got one on one with the head of Belfast Met. So, at all levels of our organisation, we work with the um, the universities and the colleges who are planning this. So I, th I think that bit works. With the department, I know they're working on the skills strategy and um, and, and how does the skills strategy work for um, um, work with the industrial strategy and what's needed next. So we're part of that debate as well. And we've got one of my team now, Casey, who's really in the middle of most of those discussions and I think is somewhat an expert in that field. So, so I think we're connected, but it is a volatile time. and. You know, I want to make sure we understand what's needed and, and how we're delivering it. And, and just, we need to be clear about that. Just, just, I mean, just on, on the point John had made about city deals uh, as well, uh, she need, um, we, we sit on the skills panels in terms of the various city deals, so it's, it's, it's actually providing support in there. And just in terms of the, the breakdown of some of the figures that Kevin gave earlier in terms of the, um, the 1,000 letters of offer that have been issued, um, 91 of those have been skills offers, um, so there's been total support of 2.5 million offered to businesses over the last six months, and that, that will generate total skills investment of about 8.5 million pounds 
Um, so, so it is still a very, as Kevin said, business as usual. It is innovation and, and R and D and skills are still critical areas. We've learned such a lot from the financial crisis in 2008 in terms of the importance of making sure that you maintain skills and upskill people. Um, and those lessons are been learned now, and that's what a lot of those engagements are in terms of helping those businesses. And some of the skills projects are up, are actually helping companies who have repurposed from core industries into new industries. Um, so, so the skills support is actually helping to convert those those individuals and their skill sets as well. Yeah, I think the skills is fundamental into all of that there, and and it feeds into the innovation piece. Um, that that I uh, I'm very much aware, Kevin, that you are concerned uh, about the funding for that innovation piece after yeah. we uh, leave uh, the European Union um, in January. So. Uh, what, what detail have you got into with the UK government in relation to their commitment for replacing the, the ERDF? And, um, or have you got any commitment to what, what the new innovation fund will look like going forward? Well, I've certainly made representations to a number of people in the UK government. I mean, both have done it personally at the Secretary of State level. Uh, and we've done it through through the Department for the Economy. And I and actually in this area, I do think there's been a fairly collective Northern Ireland approach to talk to anyone you can to try and make this happen. Because I think everyone recognizes it from every party and from every ministry that it's really important. Um, so we've certainly highlighted it a number of times. Most recently, the one I was suggesting was that if they want to take time, to, so, so UKRI, for example, I talked to the CEO and the chair of UKRI um, in the last two weeks. Uh, and UKRI is going to be a really important body for Northern Ireland and for the UK, because as the UK moves from the 1.4, 1.7% spend of GDP on R&D to its target of 2.4%, a lot of that funding will go into um, UKRI. And a lot of that will be based on leveling up agenda, new technologies, green technologies. So I, I think that they are a master of some of these um, future funding. Uh, and then through Treasury and Whitehall, they'll be the master of what will be the shared prosperity fund if that's how it's done. I think the main representation that I've been making is if, if it's going to take time to design a new scheme and do a perfect scheme for the next 10 years, take the time. But then you need to have a one-year bridging fund or something that keeps innovation moving in this critical period for Northern Ireland in the meantime. So that's the kind of representations that, that we've been making and I know that others have been, uh, been making. And I think it was echoed even by the finance minister yesterday with the other DA. I think it's fundamental um, that we get that uh, we get some clarity around that because yeah. innovation and skills it all drives the productivity and ability for us to grow our economy here, which is vital. And then the third and final thing that I would like to 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 talk to you about is your one of your drivers leveling up. Obviously, um, leveling up to me means regional balance. Uh, and addressing the needs of those areas with the highest unemployment, economic inactivity uh, and poverty, etc. What mm -hmm. steps have your organisation taken um, to ensure that you can measure uh, and uh, assess that, that you are effectively levelling up Northern Ireland? Well, we're, the first thing is um, completely behind the agenda to make sure we level up both kind of regionally within Northern Ireland and then, as you say, socially, economically. I mean, leveling up's got many different dimensions. The way we measure it is we, we, we've been kind of very active in the last months with working with councils in each of the regions, talking to their economic development committees, meeting the council leaders, working at a local level as our team do, uh, and sure that we've got shared data. So we give, I think, every six months or every three months to the councils the full kind of indicators of you know what's happening in their region, what are the jobs, what are the investment projects we're doing, which are the offers we're making, which are the sectors which are growing and shrinking. Um, and unless the data is so small, unless the, unless the data becomes in a small enough group that it's, we shouldn't identify it because you can tell it's for a certain business, then we, we share everything we have with the... Uh, uh, with the regions and with the councils quite frequently. Just, just Shane, maybe just to, to add to that, I know I, I've kind of given figures before me, Kevin referenced the a thousand, a thousand projects that, that we, uh, our letters of offer that we've issued since um, since March. Uh, 
94% of those offers have, have gone to locally owned um, businesses. Uh, and I know there's a point in terms of leveling up across Northern Ireland. So just, just to give you some of the stats, 73% of those offers are outside of Belfast, as is 57% of the planned investment and 59% of the jobs. So, so I mean, um, I, I know we've had these discussions before. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to provide that information. I should have said earlier on when the chair asked the question in terms of access to information, we, we do put all of our information on open data access so anyone, any, anybody could get access to it. So we, we give that link to Peter so they can share it with members. And also, Kevin, just reference in terms of uh, the councils, we, we, we do regional economic briefing uh, re reports for each of the 11 council areas and more than happy to share those links as well in terms of that's a lot of the activity that we do in those council areas, but it also um, it encompasses lots of, of other activity that's happening from other agencies. So we, we kind of collectively put it into one report, but we, we'll share that information as well. Thank you very much, Donald. That would be very helpful indeed. Uh, and uh, Kevin is very well aware um, of, of my um, my heightened, I suppose, concern about what levelling up means in sub-regional development, etc. And, and the one thing that Kevin and I discussed um, there uh, last month when we, we got together uh, was about the skills. Skills are so important for investors and employers. I mean, it is, it's the key driver for any business. Uh, and we've got 40,000 higher education places in Belfast and 4,000 in Derry. That's not levelling up. We'll never level up until we actually change that type of statistics um, uh, and that. But um, as I say, I've gone over that in detail with Kevin uh, and the team of Invest AI many, many times. Well, maybe I should just, just to add to, to that, um, um, again, whenever it's completed, we'd be more than happy to share it. We, we along with colleagues at DFE, commissioned the EU Economic Policy Centre to do a competitiveness um, benchmarking Northern Ireland with, with other um, small advanced economies. Um, and, and education and skills comes out as a fundamental key area that Northern Ireland should be um, getting behind in terms of actually improving competitiveness. So. It, it's 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 absolutely in line with with the points that you're making. And I said again, we 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 use those sorts of reports again in order to try and develop uh, advice, support, and and uh, solutions. So, so we, we'll share that information with you as well with the committee. Uh, and just back into to that type of information uh, and what uh, Kevin said earlier about feeding in, it's very important that Invest and I feed that in, and that that becomes uh, you know the centre stone of any yeah. program for government. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Kevin and Donald, for the presentation. That was very useful um, this morning. Uh, two points that I want to talk about. Um, obviously, you'll be aware of the announcement this morning of the potential of uh, 100 jobs being lost in, uh, in Belfast, uh, two of the pubs, the Duke of York, and the heart bar as well. Obviously, uh, that's very concerning. That's prior to any potential further restrictions coming into play. Uh, my constituency has uh, already seen additional restrictions. Um, there's concern um, at further job losses. And what we're hearing from the finance minister uh, over this course of this past 24 hours around potential schemes, I think it's going to be uh, significantly less than what would be required to secure jobs and, and uh, keep people in employment. I just want to hear from yourselves in terms of the impact of these many lockdowns, as we call them, or uh, the potential rollout of that across NI. Have you any assessment at all? We hear of you know potential 100,000 job losses. Have you any assessment as to what you think the lasting impact of that will be, the short-term impact uh, more so? Um, short answer, Gary, is I don't have a, an impact assessment on the impact of kind of hospitality sector. I mean, I know the sector is obviously clearly challenged and that the less free people are to circulate and socialize and go to restaurants and hotels, then the, the more challenging it would be for them. I think, is there 27,000 people working in hospitality in Northern Ireland? I, mean, I know it's a, it's a very large number. And I know that um, the first assessments we saw of um, risk said that there was 90% of the jobs in hospitality and tourism that were a risk. Those are the numbers in the Q1 part of the, um, the kind of presentation, the April to June, when there was a very strict lockdown. 
So I can well believe that if there's a very, very strict lockdown again, that those that kind of proportion of roles are, are equally at risk. So I recognize that. I do think we've moved on a bit though, that if you look at businesses I go to, companies I go to, you know, people, a lot of companies' offices have adapted to safe working actually. And, you know, if you think back to April, May, we were talking about, can you go to work safely? Can you go to the factory? Can you go to an office? And uh, I think now it is quite common that, you know, I was in the office yesterday, I'll be there again tomorrow. You, know, you, you can operate safely in many areas. You know, I, I hope there's still some good things that in the hospitality sector that can be done to make sure we can improve safety, whether you're in a hospital, sorry, in a hotel or in a university canteen or, or things like that to try and minimize contact between people and potential infection. Um, but I imagine the scale of it could be the same risk. Okay. And in terms of um, investors and the conversations that you're having, you know, the, many of these companies, I can only think, uh, speak for, for local, um, the local situation in regards to companies that come and invest here. Many of them require, you know, or in the past have required really office accommodation. A lot of them will be sitting close together. You know, what are you doing those people in terms of, obviously there's, you know, COVID's going to be with us for some time. So well, what incentive do they have to come and invest here uh, if, you know, the, the, a lot of the work could be done remotely so they wouldn't need to invest here at all? So I think that, so there's clearly been a very changing dynamic around that. And uh, many of the um, big offices with 300, 400 people here providing software support, tech service support. <clears throat> in February, they would have said, you need to have people in the same building to train them, to keep the data safe. Most of them don't say that now. They know that they can run an office um, with people mostly remotely. So it's a different dynamic. But there are groups that are being recognized as needing an office environment. Uh, and uh, we've done our surveys, I've seen surveys from other companies, but, uh, and I visited ScreenCloud, for example, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a startup in uh, Belfast. I mean, when you're hiring big groups of people, you, you do miss something in a company if you never meet the people you're gonna work with. So I think people kind of early in their career, new to a role, still want to have um, a physical location. So I still think offices will be important, but you won't, I think in the future, need the office for 400, you may need an office for 100, which is 25, 30% of your workforce and rotate people in and out of it. Um, so I think the investors are going to be looking for different things. I have still got investors from the US who are looking for big offices in Northern Ireland. So they're still looking. Actually, in, in February, we had shortages in some cities about availability of grade A office accommodation. Maybe now the picture is more balanced and we can provide some attractive and um, offerings to um, kind of future investors as perhaps some existing businesses move some of their workforce outside will free up space for investors to move in more quickly than they would have been otherwise able to do. Just, just to add to that, Gary, um, in, in terms of, like I said previously that we do a lot of engagement with businesses and, and Steve Harper, our international um, uh, colleague director, <coughs> has been in lots of virtual meetings with um, a lot of existing investors. Um, and, and, and what we're finding is that the, the kind of the key selling point for Northern Ireland in terms of international investors, i.e. the talent base, uh, is still the thing that they that they are seeking. So yes, people can work remotely, but they need to have the talent. And, and, and certainly our pipeline is showing that they are still looking for the talent. The, the other critical element uh, encouraging for us is that a lot of the international investors have said that uh, through COVID, they were looking at how their operations, how resilient they've been across the globe. Um, and, and we very positively have come out very, very highly in that to say that Northern Ireland, the resilience in Northern Ireland uh, wasn't adversely affected for lots of those international investors. So it has given them confidence um, that Northern Ireland not only has the resilience and the connectivity, but we always have and still have the talent base that we have in terms of what they're looking to actually secure as well. So that's, that's encouraging for us in terms of those in, engagements. That's welcome news and, and thanks for that. Uh, just a final question. Obviously, we're all interested in the city deals uh, right across Northern Ireland. Uh, but another issue which I've been meeting with um, the local port regarding is the issue around free ports. And we know that Belfast are at a, a certainly a more advanced stage. And, and I think that that's a very good thing. Where do, do, does um, Invest and I have a role there? Are you involved in those conversations? And is that something that you have on your your uh, presentation is something that you know is a good thing for Northern Ireland. 
I, I mean, from my side, um, Gary, I mean, it's a very, it's a complex subject first. I think um, and I've heard many different opinions on the value of free ports. You know, can the whole of Northern Ireland be a free port and can it get the kind of um, different corporate tax rates for the whole region that have been discussed, I know, in previous versions of Parliament? And is that out of date now? And I think, so, I, so I've heard views on that. Um, I've heard some individual ports pushing, you know, or a local agenda. Can we, should we have a different um, free port system in one place or another place? A bit less keen on that because it's hard to level up if you've got display, displacement risk for businesses moving from one town to another town because there's preferential taxation or things like that. So I, mean, I think so, so I, I, there are some bad configurations in free ports, um, but I think there can be some interesting ideas as well. And, Certainly from my side, I've, I've run Freeport operations in Tunisia, where we were able to bring product in, convert it and take it out, which was good for the local economy. Uh, and we were able to get around some of these challenges. Um, but our role at the moment has more been helping to get the different groups who are interested to get in a room together and talk about it. Uh, and we did some of the initial convening of some of those meetings. I know Department of Finance have more recently taken over the leadership in that role, and the leadership does sit there, not with us, um, but we're happy to listen, participate, and, um, and support. But I, I do think it's quite complex. Yeah. Gary, just, just to add, add to that, we, we have facilitated a number of stakeholder meetings, and that, that has included um, the, the, four, the, the three airports representatives um, from, from, from all of those various areas, plus representatives from the district council areas that, that each of those um, uh, ports and airports are, are based in. So we've had a couple of stakeholder engagements. As you know, the, the final date for the consultation uh, was the 12th of July. Um, uh, as Kevin said, it's been dealt with by the Department of Finance because it's a, it's a treasury matter um, and we're expecting the, um, the Chancellor to come out um, maybe around the time of the autumn statement um, in, in terms of what the, the future plans are. But the encouraging thing is that all of the key stakeholders in Northern Ireland are engaging with, uh, with, with one another and they, they are working, you know, so Foilport is working closely with Belfast and uh, Larne and, and uh, Warren Point in terms of how can we actually look at putting some consolidated uh, perspective forward for Northern Ireland as opposed to each port or each airport looking to do their own thing. So, so, so there is collective single discussion going on at the moment, which is positive. Thank you very much. That was useful. Thank you. Um, is there any um, analysis being done in terms of the, uh, the benefits or the downsides to um, the potential for displacement around um, three ports as well? Yes, sure. In fact, I can pick it up. Um, co colleagues in the Department for the Economy are undertaking uh, work at the moment in terms of actually looking uh, at the policy implications around free ports and uh, looking at kind of product journeys uh, and what that would look like. So that, that uh, I mean, there's a number of work streams that both DFE and DOF are involved in at the moment, so that that, that uh, work is ongoing at present. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Kevin and Donald for your presentation. I would start off with a bit of positive feedback. I had a recent uh, visit uh, from our minister, the economy minister, Dion Dodds, down to Bangor. We visited two companies that have been working with Invest NI, Denroy and uh, Priory Packaging. Denroy are, have been able to diversify uh, with support from Invest NI into manufacture of visors. They have also designed uh, masks, a reusable mask, and are continuing to work with the health service on the, the possibility of being in a good position to bid for a multi-million pound contract uh, for to supply PPE. The other firm is Priory Packaging Company, North Down based company again, um, a local company that uh, are working in uh, packaging for the food industry and they are about to invest £1 million in new plant. So uh, we would pass on our thanks to those from Invest and I who have been working with them. I think they, there was a lot of good feedback we got from them, and they uh, really do appreciate the work of Invest and I and all the help they've got over the years. So I think that's good to hear. And I think when we were out and about, you realise that these businesses have worked through COVID and uh, had to work with it. And... Uh, those people, they may have had some people in furlough, but the, the, the factories continue to, to run. 
and I think we, we do appreciate the efforts that have been made by people like that. They weren't um, sitting at home uh, working, they were down on the shop floor working, and I think we all need to realise that, that that does continue. Just a couple of questions. I keep going back to the thing about, and it's already been mentioned by some members, about existing businesses and the impact of the loss of the furlough scheme which will be in some way uh, supplemented by the, the further support. But I do worry about places like Bombardier, who have 3,000 odd people working, and uh, quite a lot of them would be from my own constituency, not just from my own constituency, of course, but people travel quite a bit to it from uh, mm -hmm. right across Northern Ireland for their work. And uh, I do worry about it, and I do feel that some morning we'll wake up and hear of a significant job loss in, in large sectors like that. And I, you start thinking, what has uh, Invest NI done to, uh, to put off that terrible day? And I appreciate work is being done, but could you give us some assurance that you're continuing to work with businesses like Bombardier to find alternative work and maybe perhaps reskilling and so on, and trying to um, help them as best you can to, to stop job losses. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you for the feedback on the, the two companies on the Denry and Priori packaging, and I'll make sure some of that feedback goes to the client executives who yeah. kind of work hard every day, sometimes get a bit unnoticed. So thank, thank you for your feedback on that. For, for Bombardier and for the aerospace sector, I mean, we really recognize the challenges for it. Uh, and we are, I can assure you, we're intimately involved with the companies in that sector, both the large ones like Bombardier, and then also many of the suppliers around that, including Denroy actually, who were a major supplier to aerospace in, in the past and have now switched to some of these other products as long as they along with their hairline products that they make as well. Um, for Bombardier, it's clearly a big employer. Um, they did put people on furlough. They have had um, um, a round of um, redundancies they had been requesting an extension to the furlough scheme and they were quite vocal about it and were kind of expressing requests for that both in Westminster and in Stormont. Uh, and I know that they were um, kind of pleased to see these new schemes which have been announced by the Chancellor um, was it two weeks ago. Um, so, so, so there is some replacement for what would have been you know, quite a, a short-term problem for them with the expiry of the CJRS. Um, the things that we're doing with them actively is one is um, kind of helping make sure that the, 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 the transaction still goes ahead and you know that um, Bombardier are, being, are going through an acquisition process by Spirit. So we are actively engaged where we can to try and help um, answer questions or deal with issues that um, could confound that um, transaction. So that bit we're very active with at a corporate level. Um, then at an R&D level, We've certainly been helping um, Bombardier and the aerospace sector look at ATI and the different ways of funding things like the zero flight projects in the future. And um, we have got some, I can't say much, but we, we have got some active um, R&D project proposals we're looking at for, uh, for Bombardier. Um, and some of it is around helping you know, secure skills and um, technology in what they do. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is, as you know, we, we do support work with the um, Composite Centre, which will also be part of the future city and growth deals. So we're also helping make sure that um, there are kind of active projects, R&D and innovation that can help um, provide, I think, kind of gainful activity for, um, for Bombardier in this kind of interim, what's likely to be a two-year or three-year period. Um, of difficulty for the um, for the aerospace um, sector. So yeah, we, we're really active a lot in uh, in, in Lombard. Good, that's reassuring. Moving on, my, my second main point is um, what about invest supporting the point about office grade A office accommodation outside of Belfast and Londonderry, places like Bangor, where we're trying to regenerate the town centre. What what is the your thoughts about uh, supporting? In the construction of Grade A office accommodation, saying within the Bangor Town Centre, you've got the you know the train service. There's no reason why people couldn't uh, go there on a daily basis to work. All been well. COVID has changed the 
the thing at, at, yeah. as it is as it stands at the moment. But I do feel we need to to get more of a focus on towns, even in the Greater Belfast area, who have who need regenerated. And what about Invest NI? Being part of that by supporting, for an example, the construction of Grade A office accommodation to bring workers in private sector, public sector. I was down at the Titanic Quarter recently uh, dealing with uh, the company that, Capita that, that deals with the Pippa Peels. They're sitting in lovely offices in, in the Titanic Quarter, ideal situation, but there's no reason why we couldn't have that in, in places like Bangor and other, other large towns around the province. Well, certainly, I mean, Bangor to Belfast is but a train ride away, so I, I know it's um, very close. Um, for us, we, we do have a property team, with a couple of things. First is we do have a property team who look at um, investment projects. I, I think we've got some real kind of expertise in there. Um, we don't buy land anymore. I, mean, that, I think we haven't done for five or 10 years, and I know we often get asked about that, but we, we don't invest in, in land. Um, we have supported some office projects, and I've certainly seen some proposals, and we've done some appraisal on things. Yep. Uh, I've also talked to employers and potential employers for Bangor, actually, in, in the last uh, months. Um, but I think that if there is a good commercial proposition and then there isn't a requirement for a government intervention, then the ideal situation is that they're commercially driven projects first. So unless there is a a kind of specific need, and I don't know the Bangor requirements well enough, then, then generally we would you know, rely on private sector first and only step in when we have real evidence of failure. But I would say that, you know, I think all over Northern Ireland and the UK and many other places, you know, I think that councils will be looking at regeneration projects over the next few years. And COVID changes the shape and space of, um, of, the, of the city centre. And I think for all of us, you want the vibrant city centres. I mean, that's part of the culture of who we are, and it's part of the economic fabric of the country. So we're certainly, we, we engage actively in local economic development plans with councils, and I'd be very keen to be involved in those as they look at kind of life after COVID and the new business world um, to, 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 for what they may need in the future, whether that's offices or incubation spaces or you know, shared working facilities or any, any of those discussions, we'd be happy to make sure we have our kind of economic vision to that. Okay, well, thank, thanks for that. And I do appreciate the, the need. I do think it is an, an issue needs looked at. Um, the fact that obviously COVID is an impact, but there are areas like, I suppose to go back to the Bangor situation, which I know well, but you know, we, we've, we've waited for years for uh, the private sector to come along and, and deliver, and it hasn't happened. And for various reasons, it hasn't happened, and I don't think it's going to happen in, in the near future. But you know, with the support of government and, and to be a catalyst and to, and to help to drive it, I think we could we could see delivery. But we certainly will will keep in the focus on that and appreciate the points made. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, Kevin and Donald, for what you what you're doing. Thank you. Gordon, um, and just to, uh, to uh, make a similar point to Gordon, I know of um, a business in my own constituency, um, Paragon Health, that was able to diversify and to make face masks for the, the health service as well, and, and they had support from Invest in, in doing so, um, and that is really important work. I see just mm. in terms of that piece around diversification um, for of supply chain development, is there a, additional uh, work being done around that, particularly in the space of PPE? Yeah, so we've uh, we've worked with about 450 companies so far in terms of um, diversification and then PPE, whether it's diagnostic testing or face masks or visors or a little bit in the beginning about ventilator equipment and some of the engineering side of it. Uh, and a lot of that work is ongoing. Um, I know that um, we've had over a hundred million pounds of orders that um, Northern Irish companies have got for PPE because of some of this um, diversification work. Uh, and I think there's a line of sight to 200 million pounds when you include um, supplies into the UK. So, you know, what, what a great way to rebuild a bit of fast business in Northern Ireland um, facing a critical health situation. It helps protect people and employees who deal with patients, and it also helps the economy. So we're clearly going to support that um, you know, going forward as well.
Uh, and and you, 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 you asked earlier, Chair, about some of the future schemes, and at least one of the schemes that will be <coughs> launched before the end of the year will help businesses uh, look at that in a bit more detail as well. Thank you. Um, can we bring Claire into the spotlight, please? <coughs> Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Kevin and Donal. Um, Kevin, since you've been in post, um, you know, I applaud you for, for really pushing the idea of innovation in Northern Ireland, and I think certainly Northern Ireland is ripe to seize those opportunities. Um, I suppose what I would ask is what that innovation actually looks like and what is Invest NI doing to encourage that? Um, I suppose, however, I, I um, have experience with Invest NI in the last couple of years where I've been trying to encourage you know, a particular uh, type of innovation up in my own constituency. And I was quite disappointed at the level of engagement with Invest NI and almost a suggestion that, that, the, that the idea had to be much further along, which were, you know, for me, innovation is about a new idea and exploring uh, the, the opportunities with that and, and, and doing all that due diligence and I think that's where Invest NI has that role. Um, so I'd be keen to understand from your perspective what you believe Invest NI's role is if there are innovative ideas within uh, Northern Ireland, whether they be at the very start of the idea maybe slightly along and if it's coming from really small businesses as opposed to big businesses because I know some of the criticisms that I would hear from constituents is that Invest and I are only interested if you know if they can see the colour of their money. If you're a big business, if you're coming from outside of Northern Ireland, so what is Invest and I doing for Indigenous businesses? You know, at that kind of early stage of of of, of the the idea. Uh, so thanks, Claire, for that. Listen, the first thing is, I mean, I I think the, the innovation funnel it only works if you get a lot of input in the beginning, because I mean, innovation to me is about you, you have to have you have to have a thousand ideas and then. You kind of work on them and you advance them and some fail and some succeed and some move forward to the next stage. And at the end of the funnel, you'll get three fantastic ideas that will change the world, you know. But you have the, the hard thing in innovation is that you don't know which of which three of the thousand are the ones that are going to do it. That's the hard one. You yeah. know? So you, you need the thousand and you need to kind of work on them. So uh, I would certainly support um, kind of as many as the kind of innovative ideas as we can. Um, okay. And particularly things like the innovation voucher scheme that we run is quite broad church in terms of availability for businesses. I think it's SMEs only, if I remember, but it's quite broad access. And that is the first bit I think you're talking about. It's £5,000. Um, it will help you take, I think I've got an idea, I think it makes sense. Maybe I've got a drawing somewhere, but how do you move that to the next bit, the kind of early, early stage mm -hmm. of the feasibility? Uh, and I know that. I think we closed, we, we did a scheme in um, April to June and we've just closed the second scheme. But in the first one we ran in this financial year, we had double the applicants and nearly double the awards. So some mm -hmm. great kind of quality ideas. So yeah. um, and I, I hope that your constituents will find some kind of big ears when they when they talk to Invest Northern Ireland around those kind of projects. Yeah. And that's not I, happened before, I don't know, whatever the reason. But yeah, no, and I'm glad again because um, it was probably pursuing even before your time and you know maybe you're, you're encouraging a, a new culture with invest in i and, and, and i you know i, I look forward to, to seeing the positive benefits of that but I, I suppose you know where i'm coming from it's not necessarily the financial resource that they're looking for because the idea doesn't need it it's the expertise it's the open doors it's you know what i believe invest in i should be there for it should have that um you know, understanding of, of uh, international markets, understanding the culture, the ethos, and just trying to, to um, lend that support that someone from Northern Ireland who just wants to, you know, create a product and create a business, you know, wants to get on with. And it's it's that networking almost. Um, and I suppose that isn't what's being offered. And, you know, I do appreciate your point that, you know, there could be thousands of ideas and how do we, you know, crystallise that into the ideas that are actually going to take Northern Ireland forward. But I suppose just to give you an example of where, I'm frustrated is that you know they have an idea you know it, it seems very positive um, but there's no kind of end point for them there's no market there's no supply chain there's 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 no um, kind of uh, production point or, or anything like that and it, it's really you know what, what role would Invest and I have with that? So it's not just about here's a check for five grand because to be honest, wouldn't touch it. And as I say, that it's not the financial uh, support they need. It's it's your expertise. It's it's all that other stuff that to me is as is, is as important as a check. Yeah, 
let's talk about some of that stuff then. And I'm intrigued now anyway, but, um, but we have, so I, I have 61 technical experts on my team. Okay. Yeah. And, and the kind of things that they're able to do, and I've watched them in action and they're brilliant. I mean, they, they will help you look at things like um, regulatory design. So if you're looking at a medical device or something which needs to have electronic compatibility and, you're, and you've got a new idea, but you're not used to doing business, how do you find out about these things? So yeah. for any business in Northern Ireland, open access we have to these, um, to these experts. So you can do that. Second thing we've got is we've got a business information service, okay. which is I mean, virtually now, I guess it's in our office in, the, in, in Belfast, but it's available to anyone and you can commission work on I don't know, I've got a brilliant idea to, I don't know, save the whale in Iceland, but you know, what is the market for saving whales in Iceland? You know, how much money is in that? And is there a potential for this? Mm. You can do that work with our business information center. I mean, it's an amazing okay. resource. So it's not, it's not cash. I, I think what we bring in terms of experience and expertise is much more valuable than the funding for many of the projects we get involved mm. with. And often it's the conversations with our team who will talk to you about other companies and how they've gone abroad and how they entered the market and what is market segmentation and how could you apply it. I think those conversations are really valuable. And that's what I hear when I go around to, to talk to different companies. So um, you know, I certainly recognize the importance of that as well. And we do have some kind of expert resources who can do it. I would love to have more, but that's mm -hmm. the, yeah. the level. Have. I do think we need to talk about how we build and rebuild those the skill sets to do that and how we can expand that across um, across Northern Ireland. Uh, and I would say as well that we do facilitate a lot of networking between business to business uh, and then also things like mentorship. I set up my own um, you know, mentorship contacts this week, you know, where I've got, I know someone who's a, he's just runs so many companies in the field that he's brilliant at talking to young businesses. So we connect him into the networks who want that. So I mean, I, I think these things are really important, you know, and they're also fun to be part of. Yeah, no, thank you, I appreciate it. I will follow up with you now that I've piqued your interest. Um, uh, and the last point, and you, you've already talked about this in relation to skills, and I, and I think you, you did allude to this when you when you talked about the, the Assured Skills Academies, and I'll declare an interest here because my, my husband ran one of those. Um, and they were super successful, and you know I think industry was really pleased with them because they were almost tailor-made to um, support the skills that they need within business that maybe don't already exist. And you know I think there's, there's big opportunities, not just within the universities, and I suppose this is my point, you know, look towards um, uh, further education um, colleges, uh, not least for the regional uh, balance across Northern Ireland, which is easier facilitated than, than the two kind of main hubs in, in, in Derry and Belfast and, and Corian as well. Um, you know, so I, I, I think, you know, we, we need more of that. We need to be talking to business and understanding what they need and uh, creating skills on that basis. Yeah. So just add to Kevin's point in terms of uh, within innovation, we, we have an innovation escalator, um, so it, it runs from innovation vouchers, which is at the lowest level, right up to dealing with competency centres within universities and, and every element in between. So um, all, all of our technical experts um, um, have knowledge and detail in terms of those different stages of the escalator, so we would be more than happy to, to pick that up after, after the session. And again, um, j just in terms of, um, forgive me, in terms of some of the statistics, the, 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 the thousands letters of offer that we have issued since March of this year. Over 500 of those have been in research, development and innovation. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the to total support that we've offered, it's in the order of about nine million pounds. So, so there is um, active ongoing engagement in terms of innovation and skills development. And we're following up with actual um, investment going into businesses to help them develop those areas. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Um, I think that's it from members for questions. So, um, Kevin and Donald, thank you very much for your time and for um, the briefings this morning being very helpful. Um, and, and we'll be in touch in relation to some of that. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Okay, then we're moving on to item number five, which is our briefing from NIE Network um, on COVID 19 response and recovery. There is a clerk's memo at page 66 of your pack and a briefing presentation from NIE at page 72. Um, and can we bring into the spotlight Paul Stapleton and Randall Gilbert, please? Um, Paul is the Managing Director of NIE Networks and uh, Randall is the Head of Network Strategy at NIE Networks. 
So if I hand over to yourselves to make um, an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members. Okay, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning. Um, can I confirm if you're hearing us okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay, um, well, good morning, everybody. And as the Chair has said, I'm joined this morning by Randall Gilbert, who's our Head of Network Strategy, and Randall leads our, our engagement with the energy strategy process. Um, we very much welcome the opportunity to have this engagement with the committee uh, this morning. Uh, we would have met a number of members individually earlier in the year, uh, and not least at a an event we held at Instalments Long Gallery in February, and uh, much has changed since then, I guess, so we're, we're glad to have the opportunity to pick up to the, the discussion this morning. Uh, it's good to see the committee's continued interest in the, in the area of energy, and uh, not least building on the micro-inquiry which you initiated before the summer, and uh, to which we, we provided a comprehensive response, and we look forward to seeing the outcome of that process as well in due course. The COVID pandemic has obviously uh, dominated everything over the last six months, uh, and I think it has, while it's been challenging, it has created both an opportunity and an urgency to progress a green recovery in response to that and make, and make progress towards the long-term goal of net zero. Um, and that is very much the context of the discussion we want to have with the committee this morning. We've shared uh, a detailed document, and I, I hope to go through that at, at a very summary level and, and touch on some of the main points the context there is set out on page two, um, and I guess the overall arching context is the requirement to achieve net zero by 2050. There is, as you know, an energy strategy process um, in train uh, led by the Department for the Economy. We welcome and support that process. We expect that process will set the direction for a net zero energy system by, by 2050. And we're working collaboratively with the utility regulator, with Sony, with the department and with all the other stakeholders involved in that process. However, that process is not due to complete until at the end of 2020, 2021, the end of next year at the earliest. Uh, and we believe there's an opportunity to accelerate some aspects of energy policy and make decisions now to contribute to a green recovery and create some economic stimulus in advance of that. Some aspects of energy policy are complex and will take time to work through but in other areas, the direction of travel is very clear and there's no reason not to move ahead now. Um, on page three there, we just touched briefly on our role. As you'll be aware, uh, NIE Networks owned, owns and manages the electricity networks here in Northern Ireland. We supply uh, over 880,000 customers, every home, farm and business across Northern Ireland, connecting them to a safe and reliable uh, energy supply. We also have a significant economic footprint. We invest over 100 million pounds per annum in, in the electricity infrastructure. We employ uh, 1,200 people directly and support many other jobs indirectly. And we contribute of the order of 150 million pounds annually to the economy. We are a regulated uh, entity, regulated by the utility regulator. Um, so all our costs and all our investments ultimately are paid for by customers through the electricity bill. And that is all overseen and determined by the utility regulator. Uh, network costs typically account for about 20% of your electricity bill. So as a regulated entity, we don't have a direct commercial interest in selling more electricity. Our role is, is an enabling one to provide a network to enable the energy transition to happen and, and to continue to provide a safe and reliable energy supply. Before uh, touching on some of the policy areas specifically, I suppose I just want to highlight the, the key importance we see in engaging customers, communities, and broader society uh, on these issues. Um, the energy transition will not just be about infrastructure or indeed new technologies. It's also ultimately about changing customer behavior, helping customers to, to make the right choices. Our research and indeed other research supports the view that most people do want to do the right thing and do want to make changes to support climate action. However, they need support and advice to do so. And I think that's a really important uh, part of the process. We also need to be mindful of affordability uh, to make sure we, we consider the impact on prices of everything we do in this regard, and particularly focus on those who are most vulnerable and those who, who are in fuel poverty. So in each of the next eight slides, um, deals with specific policy areas where we believe progress can be made in the short term in advance of concluding the overall energy strategy. 
and to move us forward quickly towards a green recovery. The first area touches on, on slide five, uh, touches on policy and regulation. The utility regulator plays a very important role in this process and in, in, in the industry. We believe their current mandate is too narrow. Their mandate is solely focused on protecting the interests of customers. And while that is obviously very important, we believe that could also be balanced with a mandate, giving the UR a mandate to have a role around decarbonisation and supporting the energy transition, and also a role in considering wider e economic implications. An example of where policy and regulation don't maybe always align at the moment would be in relation to the cost of connecting to the electricity network. Connection charges are typically higher in Northern Ireland than, they, than for an equivalent connection in GB or indeed in ROI. And the main reason for that is a different policy approach that we take here in relation to how we allocate costs as between the party connecting to the network and, and the general body of existing users, the customer base. And that policy difference uh, in approach is making Northern Ireland less competitive in terms of attracting investment. Turning to slide six, um, renewables, it is generally accepted, I think, by, by almost all experts in this field that renewable electricity will play a key role in, the, in decarbonizing the economy, not just in taking carbon out of the production of power, but in also in using that clean energy to displace fossil fuels in heat and transport. And Northern Ireland, as you'll be aware, has made huge progress in renewable energy over the past decade, with now 48% of electricity coming from renewable sources. We are leaders across these islands and indeed leaders in Europe in terms of integrating wind energy onto the system. But there has been a policy vacuum in this area over the last couple of years and some momentum has been lost in that journey. And I think there's an opportunity now to regain that momentum and to make positive progress towards more renewable energy and help to stimulate the economy as well. In that context, uh, we would very much welcome uh, the announcement by the Minister last week that the target for renewable electricity by 2030 will be not less than 70 percent. That 70 percent by 2030 target uh, is, is ambitious, but it, but it is achievable and gives the, gives the industry direction uh, which we need to get behind. But it needs to be backed up now with, with specific policy measures to, to take it forward, to drive action and to ensure there is a cross-industry approach that will require the department, the utility regulator, Sony, ourselves, and of course the renewables industry to, to, to make that possible. Turning to slide seven, a key enabler of more renewables on the system, and indeed enabling customers to avail of low carbon technologies will be investment in the network. Sony have estimated that an additional 500 million pounds investment is needed in the, in the transmission grid to enable 70% by 2030. Both the UK Climate Change Commission and the Cornwall Ionic Consulting Report, recently published by the department, um, highlights the opportunity and the need to accelerate investment in the electricity network, and indeed identified it as a no regrets option. NIE networks have the capacity and the capability to deliver that additional investment, but we do need a joined up approach across policy, regulation and the industry to make that happen and to make it happen quickly. <coughs> key enabler, or indeed a key barrier to infrastructure investment, can be the planning process. And turning to slide eight, um, planning decisions in Northern Ireland typically take much longer than for an equivalent project in GB or indeed in ROI. Um, so we need a planning process that is fit for purpose, that shows we're open for business and open for investment uh, in this economy. And while also ensuring that uh, appropriate environmental standards are protected and community interests are, are taken into account. I suppose in summary, we need a faster decisions and a more, cons and more, and a more consistent decisions within an overall framework that prioritizes clean energy infrastructure. And there's examples in Scotland and indeed New Zealand, uh, I think represent best practice in this area. I appreciate, Chair, that the issue of planning is really more a matter for, for the Minister for Infrastructure and the Infrastructure Committee, um, but it is a key aspect of enabling progress on energy. The next item I want to touch on is transport, which is also uh, more a matter for infrastructure, but again, critical to the energy, uh, energy transition. I believe electric vehicles will be the most uh, tangible and most critical 
societal change we'll see over the next decade in terms of the, the journey to a low carbon economy. But we're not at all ready for that transition in Northern Ireland. Um, we need to urgently invest in a, in a public electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Because of the low level of uptake of EVs thus far uh, here, there probably is not a commercial basis for a, a, a private player to invest in EV infrastructure yet. I certainly the experience to date would suggest that. So the options to take it forward are really to, to avail of public funding. Um, there are significant funds being put available by, made available by the UK government for EV char charging infrastructure. It's not clear whether or how that might be made available in Northern Ireland, but it certainly should be pursued. And there's also the option of funding this through, through electricity bills and spreading the cost over the longer term. NIE Networks is prepared to make initial investment to, uh, to prime this sector if that is considered the best policy option. We're probably not a player that should be in this longer term. It should really be a market-driven activity, but we're certainly prepared to play a role initially to get it moving. Turning to slide 10, um, digitalization of the energy system. The future low carbon energy system will be very much dependent on data, and particularly metering data. We need data to link supply and demand, to send the right pricing signals to customers, to enable customers to avail of, of the right decisions and make the right, the right behaviours, make the right decisions in, in their choices of how, how and when they consume energy. And I think as been touched on in your previous session with Invest in I, uh, there are very significant capabilities in digital data analytics and the broader cyber area here in, locally in Northern, in Northern Ireland. And we believe there's an opportunity to leverage that capability to progress solutions that will around data and particularly metering data in the short term and help customers make that transition to a low carbon economy. Turning to slide 11 and the area of energy efficiency. Again, this is an area where Northern Ireland is behind uh, both GB and ROI. We urgently need to future-proof new housing development. We need to be designing and building now for near zero, not, not uh, building houses today but that we're going to have to come back and retrofit new solutions in a decade's time. So this has to start by updating the building regulations. We should also be considering an energy efficiency uh, retrofit program for existing houses. And both of those measures uh, have the potential to stimulate the economy and create employment uh, locally. And the eighth area of policy we want to touch on, and again was, was referred to in your previous session, is around innovation. Um, the department's medium-term recovery plan identified clean energy as a major growth area. We believe Northern Ireland has great potential to be a leader in this area and to develop local industries supporting delivery of local clean renewable energy rather than relying on imported fossil fuels that create value in, in other economies. But to prime this innovation needs targeted policy support and it, need, it needs trials of scale. There are very, some, some very good and very in interesting projects happening, but they're probably too small in scale to be impactful and uh, need, need more support. Hydrogen electrolysis is probably an example of a technology that can play a very significant role in the longer term, but it is very much in its infancy now and needs some support to help to, to start that journey. So turning to slide um, 13, to deal with the, the, the costs and the outcomes of the proposals we're discussing this morning. Most of the policy areas we're highlighting uh, can be progressed without significant executive funding. There may be opportunities, as I mentioned, to, UK, to avail of UK government funding, and of course we should do that if we can. But ultimately, most of this investment can and will be funded by the industry itself and paid for by customers through their electricity bills over the longer term. As an example, an additional £100 million invested in the electricity network would add less than 0.5% to the average electricity bill. That's less than £3 per year for the average residential customer. And that price impact can be further mitigated if we, if we can create growth and demand. And we believe there's potential for a virtuous cycle to be created here, whereby we're investing in clean energy, creating more demand for that clean energy to replace fossil fuels. That increased demand spreads the costs and helps to mitigate prices. Um, so with less carbon, more economic activity, and more jobs. 
there is, we believe, an opportunity to bring forward investment, which could be, could be of the order of £250 million pounds over the next three years that might otherwise not happen until the middle of this decade, if some of the policy issues we're talking about this morning are, are taken forward and, and help to drive towards a green recovery. That investment and the policy measures we're discussing would have a very significant uh, impact on jobs and skills in the energy sector. Clean energy, as has been identified by the department, has the potential to be a significant contributor to new jobs and reskilling opportunities across the economy, both in protecting existing jobs in the sector and also creating new jobs in existing businesses like our own and in new, new areas right across the energy piece. That would include traditional roles such as engineering, the craft areas of electricians, plumbers, as well as new technology and skill sets in the areas of digital, um, high tech, data analytics, etc., which, which we've spoken about. And ultimately, there is the opportunity to develop also a local supply chain to support all of this and position Northern Ireland as a greener and, and smarter economy. So in summary, Chair, um, we're putting forward these ideas this morning to, to contribute to this debate. We don't uh, pretend to have all the answers, but we cert we're certainly keen to, to make a contribution. We do believe there is an opportunity to accelerate key aspects of energy policy now to drive and contribute towards a green recovery. So I suppose we would ask the committee to, to consider these issues and indeed to engage with, with the, the minister and the department and support the wider consideration of these opportunities across government and, and the executive. Um, we're happy to engage further with the committee on this and indeed happy to meet any members individually if that's helpful at any stage and uh, happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, that was a very useful briefing and, and thanks also for the um, submission that you made to our mini inquiry. Um, and there's a lot of useful information in, in your presentation today um, and an awful lot that I agree completely with because I think uh, as well as being the right thing to do in terms of the, the climate emergency, there's a great deal of potential in, in terms of the green recovery. Um, and I think a lot of the, the things that you have suggested there are, are things that we can follow up on and will do. Um, can I just ask, in relation to the, the announcement by the Minister that she was looking at at, at least a 70% um, renewable electricity target, um, and you have mentioned that, that that's an achievable target, um, is there space to also go further and potentially look at, at 80%? I know that that has been put forward by the Renewable Industries Group and, and it's our, our own um, party target as well. Um, is that something that, that you feel is achievable and um, what additional um, support and um, infrastructure development would be needed to, to meet either of those targets? Sure. Um, I might, I might ask Randall to comment in, in a minute on the more detailed analysis around the different options that's happening. But uh, in terms of my own view on that, uh, Chair, um, I think the most important thing is we have a target. Um, and that we start now to progress towards that target. And that, that requires investment in the grid. It requires a, a policy mechanism to provide a route to market for renewables. And it will also require planning reform. Um, whether the target is 70% or 80% to me is less important. Um, the last target was 40% and we've overachieved that. It doesn't mean that target was wrong. It means that the target had served its purpose in giving direction to the industry and creating momentum. I think if we start now and, and make the right decisions, we can achieve 70 and we can maybe go further than 70. Um, but the, the further you go, I suppose the different complications uh, come into play. So maybe I'll, I'll ask Randall to comment more specifically on the type of analysis that's happening around the, the different options. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, I mean, we do welcome the, the announcement from the minister of the minimum of 70% target. Um, as you're probably aware, you know, the, the, there is a number of working groups that the department are um, have set up as part of the energy strategy. One of them is a specific group looking at the power sector. And I know that that is very much on their agenda to come up with policy options in relation to what a target around uh, uh, 2030 might, might look like. Um, I mean, 70% is, uh, it is, it is a consumption figure, it is a, it is a utilization figure. It is not a, 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 an amount of renewables connected figure. And I think, you know, the challenge um, is really twofold. One is absolutely we do need to look at connecting more renewables to the grid if we're going to increase that target. Um, but significantly, you know, we need to look at our demand 
and 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 match the demand with supply at times if, if that consumption figure is going to increase, especially if there's going to be an increased electrical demand in the network like, like we are foreseeing if, if we go to electrification of transport and to some degree down the line of electrification of heat as well. Uh, so the, so the, you know that, that that level of demand will increase. So to, to raise that percentage figure, um, you know, is, is will, will be challenging. I think the, the important thing for me is that it, this this is set in the context of, of a, a UK's net zero ambition, you know, by 2050. Um, ultimately, we want to be decarbonized by 2050. And I think given the fact that, you know, we've made such a significant progress and we have the technologies available to us, um, you know, the power sector potentially could decarbonize earlier than 2050 in Northern Ireland with, with the right policy directions. Um, so, so the interim waypoint of 2030, um, you know, I think it's got to be seen in the context of a, of a longer time scale decarbonization strategy. Um, certainly 70%, you know, does require the things that Paul mentioned, you know, to, to happen, it does need, you know, we do need, need, need planning, you know, um, sort of tighter planning uh, timelines and, and re review. We need to look at the connections uh, policy. We look at, need to look at network investment as well, because, um, you know, there are uh, capacity issues that will need resolved during, during that period of time and investment will be required. But I think we, we need to look at demand. We need to look at new demands in terms of getting that consumption figure up. Paul mentioned uh, hydrogen and certainly hydrolysis for green hydrogen is quite energy intensive. And I think in terms of, you know, using some of that wind that, that uh, you know, is being produced at times there isn't demand might start to fill some of those gaps. Um, other new demands that we, we mentioned about electric vehicles and electricity or uh, the, the infrastructure, et cetera, required for uh, vehicle charging could be another new demand as with electric heating, et cetera. So, yeah, I think 70% is, is achievable, but I think there are certain um, things that we have, we've outlined in, the, in this report that do need to be put in place um, if we have a chance of, of achieving that. Um, thank you. Uh, Paul, you actually answered a lot of, of um, my questions, including in relation to the utility regulator's mandate. Um, I think that that is something that we will, will discuss with them also um, in uh, the next few weeks. Um, in relation to um, what you described as the um, innovation piece, the policy support that would be needed in, to support those types of projects, um, is there other things that would also be needed in terms of that stimulating investment piece? And is it um, is in terms of financial assistance as well? I, I, I think some financial assistance is probably needed to support innovation, uh, particularly for, for very early stage projects. Um, I think there's, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, there's some very interesting projects happening. Um, for example, the University of Ulster are, are, are leading a, a project involving the housing executive. Uh, we're, we're supporting it. Um, Power and I are supporting it as, as an electricity supplier around how we can link that available wind energy uh, that Randall mentioned um, that's not that's not being used at night time or when there's periods of low demand. How we can link that to help customers and particularly fuel poor customers. Um, to use that for electric water heating in their homes. Um, so projects of that nature, I think, are, are, are very interesting. And with a little bit more funding, it wouldn't, it doesn't take huge amounts to, to really get some insights. Um, and then once we have, I suppose, interesting projects of that to develop trials of scale, and I suppose scale is important in some of these trials because we can, we can, uh, if, if, you've, if you have a trial of scale, it not only proves the case, but it's something that can be developed and, and rolled out on, on a more broader basis, much, much more quickly. Uh, we are funding a certain amount of innovation ourselves in NIE networks through our current price control. Um, and again, if there was a, a regulatory model uh, to enable us to do more or fund more in that space, we could do, could do so. And that can certainly be considered as part of the next price control period. And again, would be an example of the utility regulator uh, exercising a broader mandate if there's opportunities in that space. So there are ways we can get more funding into the system, but I think it, it requires a a policy environment to enable that to happen, as well as uh, some some additional funding. Um, yeah, I'm aware of that um, UU project in relation to the the uh, uh, tackling fuel poverty thing. I think that's actually a really positive um, a way of of doing things as well, and that's something that we really need to build into to our energy strategy. Um, and I guess just one final point for myself. Um, I, I know from talking to some of the um, stakeholders that there would be concern around the skills base. So I think that's something that we, we will also be keen to, 
um, emphasise in terms of what the department is doing to, to make sure that there is that um, investment in that green skills space um, and that there is a, a potential in, in that respect as well. Um, Stuart, I think you're next. Yes, uh, Chair, thank you uh, very much for, for your presentation. Can I ask, um, you, you didn't make any reference to the north-south electricity interconnector. Uh, to what extent will you as an organisation, as a network role, have a, a, a input into that? Will you be the people that will be driving that forward? And uh, now that they both North and South have cleared the planning issues, and I do accept your argument around uh, the need to reform the planning system to allow for uh, speed of operation in terms of, of what you deliver across Northern Ireland. But I'm interested to know just exactly how you see the North-South uh, uh, connection and whether that will potentially be a game changer for electricity in Northern Ireland. Just one other very brief question. Um, I think it has been reported on, on a number of occasions that um, you have, we have in Northern Ireland an ageing network. Um, you, you made reference to the, to the need for investment in the network. Uh, how realistic is that investment and how urgent is it? Okay, thank you Stuart. I, I might take the North-South Interconnector point and then maybe I'll ask Randall to comment on, on the ageing investment. Um, in relation to the North-South Interconnector, uh, we're working very much in tandem with Sony uh, to progress that project. Uh, in terms of the different roles of the different organisations, um, Sony's responsibility is to plan the transmission system. So they identify a need for an, an, an additional transmission infrastructure, such as the North-South Interconnector. Um, and they, they also uh, seek planning permission for that and, and deal with consents locally in terms of landowners and so on. Once that process is complete, the project is effectively handed over to us, and NIE Networks will will develop and construct uh, the, the project. And in this instance, the North South Interconnector. So we will we will have a very substantial role. We will be the organisation building the North South Interconnector and and funding that development, and it will become part of our asset base that the consumers will pay or through their bills over the longer term. Um, we very much support the case and the need for the North South Interconnector. Um, it is critical, I suppose, in terms of longer term security of supply. Uh, it is critical to make sure we can, the wholesale market can operate effectively for Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland can access the lowest cost power in the system. But it is also critical for the journey towards more renewable uh, power that we talked about in terms of achieving that the 70 percent target uh, by 2030 and, and going further in decarbonising the energy system. So, in summary, we, we will have a critical role in delivering the North South Interconnector. We very much support the case for us, and we do see it as, as crucial to the, the electricity uh, system and the energy system here going forward. Um, I'll ask Randall maybe to touch on the point around ageing networks and, and the need for investment. Okay, thanks, Paul. Yes, you, I mean, you're quite right. The, the electricity network was developed. Uh, you know, if you look at the rural electrification programme, you know, you're talking 50, 60, 70 years ago. So. There, there are uh, there's quite a substantial part of the network would be would be aging. However, you know we, we don't we don't make investment decisions based on age alone. Um, we 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 have got a very comprehensive condition monitoring um, techniques on our assets now. We've we've got a very enhanced uh, inspection and maintenance regime. So we have gone through a period now over the last number of years of assessing the condition of those assets um, and also any risks associated with those assets. Um, obviously, we want to ensure that the network remains safe and reliable into the future. So this is getting the right balance of uh, not, not replacing assets too early and, and being used maybe updating the network. We're trying to maximize the use of assets that have already been paid for by, the, by, by pre previous customers and, and you know, taking into account the, uh, the condition of those, those assets and creating a, what's called a health index around them. So we, every asset would be would be classified a particular health based on its condition and risk. So that, that is a way that we, we assess the, uh, the, the, net, the existing network in terms of its, its ongoing uh, performance and capability and safety, et cetera. But we do also then you know, blend that, that uh, assessment along with our in, uh, reinforcement plans as well. So we look to the grid, we look to see where, where there are pinch points in terms of capacity, uh, or voltage considerations, and the plans are effectively merged so that we're we're taking opportunities to, you know, uh, integrate the, the the investment decision by looking towards, you know, what aging assets need replaced, but also is there a, a, a driver there for for um, for instance a reinforcement project 
uh, and vice versa. Is if the reinforcement project uh, you know is, is is required, then what are the, the implications for for the asset base as well? So as I say, we, we try to optimise those investment decisions by taking you know a view of of condition risk and also any any overlaps with our reinforcement plans as well. Spotlight, please. Should try to be Can we bring Sinead McLaughlin into the spotlight, please? There we go. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Sinead. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Paul um, uh, and Randall, for your uh, presentation uh, and for the report that we received in our packs, which I read with interest. Uh, and yesterday, I brought a motion to the the floor of the assembly, asking for um, a, a long term recovery plan um, in relation to COVID, but a long term economic plan, really, in relation to Northern Ireland. And the this. Uh, report that you presented today is exactly the type of ambition that we in Northern Ireland should have. We do need to um, accelerate our investment in renewables. We do need to accelerate our low carbon transport. Uh, we do need to optimise our innovation in and around all of that uh, and update our building regulations and uh, create a very ambitious policy environment uh, around that. And we could achieve so, so much um, if we start to do this with pace and with urgency. Um, and I think your report has come at a, a very opportune time because we need to be pushing this right into the, the heart of the executive so that we can come up with some um, long-term planning and get it into the programme for government. So thank you very much for that. In relation to the acceleration of digitalisation, um, of the energy system and the smart metering. Um, you have given examples of, of countries around the world that have done this, particularly those in Europe, and the, the rollouts have already happened. It is, um, it's apparent that there's significant savings um, that can take place uh, here and then also it, it's uh, apparent that those you know maybe that are in fuel poverty would find smart metering um, much more helpful um, in their homes we could identify you know the energy wastage and sources sources etc so w what would it take for us to be able to get that um in, in, rolled out very very quickly would it be a you know would it be a big operation to do that quickly uh, and what kind of cost would have to go uh, against that i realize that there was a business case but it's been put on hold etc but can you just tell me where we are with that well thanks Sinead. um my understanding is is the department for the economy are currently reviewing the, the cost benefit analysis for for smart metering uh, a smart metering rollout um, I think a full rollout would be a very extensive uh, project. Um, it would require a significant amount of investment and would take a significant number of years to do. Uh, so it's not something that uh, can be can be delivered overnight. Uh, however, um, I think there's an opportunity to start on a smaller scale and maybe in a more meaningful way and to target smart meters for customers who are using low carbon technologies. So for example, if a customer has an electric vehicle or an electric heating system or customers who might be part of that trial we talked about that, that, that OLC University are leading around linking um, linking energy, wind energy to heating hot water. Um, smart meters would play a critical enabling role um, in those kind of examples. A smart meter in itself doesn't add a lot of value, it gives more information. But if it's mm. part of an overall solution, uh, enabling other technologies, enabling pricing signals, enabling customers to change behavior, then it can be, play a very significant role. So our view would be to start on a, on a trial of, of, of a reasonable scale focused on customers who are in that low carbon technology space or maybe ha or have the opportunity to be in it. Um, and that would prove the case and, and test our, our, the, the, the rollout capability before embarking on a full, a full rollout across all customers. Thank you very much for that. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, Paul and Randall, for your presentation. Uh, I'm interested in the issue of planning. Uh, I note with interest your point you made about uh, the need for 
um, increased accountability for statutory consultees and including setting binding time scales. I think we'd all welcome that. Uh, do you see that as a major problem in relation to processing planning? Are you thinking about major projects? I know from my experience in this committee, wind farms can take many years before they ever get planning approvals. But are you talking generally about, about I suppose, significant planning applications? Are you talking about most of them that you're involved in, that, that there are many ways unnecessary delays? And are you keen to see some, some reform in this area? Uh, thanks, Gordon. Yes, I suppose we're, we, we are keen to see some, some reform. I suppose it, it's more particularly acute in major projects, such as, as you mentioned, wind farms or indeed the, the cluster stations that we might invest in to enable wind and other renewable connections. Um, greater accountability is one aspect of it. Um, I suppose we, we're not meeting our own targets within the, within the planning process uh, in Northern Ireland, even though those targets in terms of timescales are, are much more generous than would apply in, in, in GB or ROI. So uh, a key starting point would be do we operate, the planning process would operate within its own targets. But I think there's also a need for, for reforms around the overall planning framework if you look at Scotland, for example, they have, a, they have an overall national planning framework that prioritises um, renewable infrastructure or infrastructure that will support the green economy. And they've, they've determined, I suppose, ultimately getting to net zero as, as the ultimate goal and all infrastructure and investment uh, should align with that. And that's reflected in, in their planning process. Um, another issue we would highlight, I guess, is the, there's a lack of alignment between accountability for planning and accountability for ownership of renewable energy targets. So the councils who are making decisions on renewable energy projects don't necessarily have accountability for the, the renewable energy targets overall. Um, so I think there needs, either needs to be a more centralised or coordinated um, planning process or, or, or a delegation or an alignment of targets uh, to local council level. Um, but either way, there needs, need, there's a need for reform in, in that area. Um, I mean, the, the planning process works quite effectively for, for, for uh, probably at lower levels for smaller, more local projects. But I think it's the, it's the larger infrastructure. Um, but there, it's that larger infrastructure that will make the most critical difference in terms of moving forward towards net zero. And, and that's where we're seeing the most delays. And do you feel it has got worse uh, with the new council set up, or do you think it? It, it, it um, is still struggling with the change. Um, I, I think there's been some positive um, improvements from from the the, de the decentralisation of, of some um, planning decisions to councils, but the overall timeframes haven't changed materially. I suppose, from what we've seen, uh, we've we've done a little bit of research on this recently, which we can we can share separately with the committee, and, and we'll be looking to engage with the, the infrastructure committee on as well, uh, because I think this is, this is an important area. Um, I think the, the Department for the Infrastructure has acknowledged recently an intention to, to look to, to progress reform in the planning area, and uh, we very much welcome and support that also. Good. Well, thanks for that. Now, um, you talk about 70% target for renewables. What are the, briefly, what are all the options that you think we should be pushing? Uh, wind, obviously, is very significant. Uh, do you see any, wind, obviously, is, is now limited with the, the rocks thing. Scheme has been, been curtailed. So, what other options do you see? You, you mentioned the battery systems there that we've, we've we've talked about a number of occasions. Are they going to be a realistic player here in relation to trying to increase the, the percentage of renewables? Well, I, yeah, I might touch on the wind piece, and maybe Randall might might provide a bit more detail. But the the conclusion of the rocks regime doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, it doesn't necessarily prohibit further rollout of wind. The, the cost of wind, uh, both onshore and offshore, has fallen very considerably, and it is now a very economical um, source of energy uh, in, in comparison with fossil fuels. Um, even so, the rocks? Sorry, even without the rocks. Even, even without rocks, yeah. However, what what wind development does need is some certainty on income. So it needs a mechanism that will give it um, some security and certainty on its income. It doesn't necessarily mean require an overall net subsidy from the customer compared to other sources of energy. Um, and and uh, there's various policy instruments there's different applied both in GB and ROI around that. And I think I know the department are actively looking at, at options around that for here as well. So it needs a, a mechanism to give it some certainty on income as, a, as opposed to a, a subsidy. Um, offshore wind very much 
believe can be part of the future and probably needs to be part of the future as well um, because uh, offshore winds give more um, greater availability and uh, the wind blows stronger and more consistently offshore than it does overland um, and I suppose solar PV can, can, is also a, a much more um, the cost of solar PV has, has fallen considerably as well and that's, that's certainly a viable technology uh, in Northern Ireland um, the sun might not shine here all the time, but we have enough um, daylight uh, hours to, to enable solar to be to play an important role as well. So maybe Randall might touch on, on the role the batteries can play in terms of filling in the gaps in terms of between supply and demand. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I mean, yes, you, you did mention you know the, the seventy percent target, and I alluded earlier to some of the things that we believe need to be sort of put in place that we've talked about. Um, but certainly, you know, my understanding and our involvement in, in the power group and, and the DFE's process is that. You know, two two key things that will uh, be a, a facilitator for getting to the seventy percent target are battery storage and also the delivery of the interconnector, which Paul is talking about talked about already. So, like battery storage, I mean, the the current um, European legislation, you know, do, doesn't permit a DSO like like NA networks to own battery storage, but our role would be to facilitate the connection of that battery storage onto the network in an efficient manner. So that it, you know, it can be utilised. But certainly, we would see that battery storage, you know, um, I, either at a sort of a commercial level or even even at domestic, um, does help that that uh, problem we talked discussed there about you know capturing that 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 energy that is being generated at times when there isn't a natural demand there. So, I think you know, battery storage is one one aspect of the solution, um, along with other other demand uh, you know solutions as well. As I said, we have. You know, we've got around about 1,700 megawatts of, of, of renewable power connected to the grid at the minute. Yesterday, the load on the system varied between 600 megawatts and 1,200 megawatts. So, you know, on a very windy day, you know, we've, we've more than enough renewables connected to meet the current demand. So, this this challenge is two sided to me. It's, it's it is facilitating that increase, but it's also being able to utilise the energy in a more efficient way uh, to ensure that that, that utilisation figure. You know, does increase, so I can definitely see that battery storage has a, has a part to play in, in that solution. The big challenge is though getting that, that source into the grid with an, an effective uh, grid system that will take it. We're all aware of the issues there's been trying to get you know wind farms connected into the grid. They're obviously located in very remote areas, and uh, I suppose in lesser populated. Uh, parts of the country, so the demand there locally is is not the same as it would be, say, in the Greater Belfast area. So, how do you do that? Do you see that as a challenge? I suppose trying to get the, those battery systems connected into into the grid and being able to be effective and efficient. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you had on a point there that yeah, you know, we have we have a, we have a design of a system that you know originally the network was designed to to bring electrification to the west from the power sources in the east and and now with the uptake of renewables the, the, the major generation capability is in the west of the province um you know and and yes still still the, the, the major demand is in the east and that does present present challenges in terms of of grid and and reinforcement but as Paul alluded to the the, the, the tso has plans uh, there's 500 million in the next 10 years to address those issues, you know, and to to reinforce the the network in, in places to to allow that to to be accommodated. So that it sort of gets back to one of our key points we made earlier in the paper about you know bringing some of that investment forward and 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 that anticipatory investment being able to reinforce ahead of need so that the grid doesn't become um, a hindrance or a blocker towards the transition towards towards a net zero. So I think you know yes there, there are challenges but I think if we if we can work with the likes of the TSO and the utility regulator to identify projects that we feel will you know advance that cause and make make those connections more efficient uh, and, and timely then I think we 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 will go, go a long way towards uh, you know uh, towards achieving this target. Well, thanks very much. I think that has been very useful and it's given us some pointers for the committee to to focus on. And the department to focus on relation to especially the renewables. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Um, Paul and Randall, thank you very much for that um, briefing. Um, the committee will be bringing the findings of its um, micro inquiry back uh, to the committee in the next couple of weeks. And is this issue something we'll be returning to um, on a regular basis? So I'm sure you'll be back in with us quite soon.
Very happy to do so. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, here, do you want to Chair, we're, we're bringing back the, the findings we had from the Energy Micro Inquiry on, I'm open on the 21st uh, meeting, and that will then lead to Committee agreeing a motion to bring to the Assembly. Today was a really good illustration of the sorts of suggestions we've had, obviously from um, the, the, the NIE networks, they're, they're putting down the network, if you like. We've heard suggestions from a lot of other sectors, renewables and so on, as to how some of the questions that members have raised. <laughs> Sorry, you need to go on mute. Um, uh, renewable, the renewable sector, some of the questions that members were asking about battery, localised battery, we, we've talked about that, um, and it's how, the, how that can be done on a localised basis where it's not necessarily going to involve NIE networks having to put a lot of infrastructure in. Yeah. I think a lot of it's going to be around creativity and imagination. Mm -hmm. um, inventing solutions for issues we've identified that um, are completely localised. You know, there's a lot of um, issues here around this that won't be the same anywhere else. So localised solutions are going to be really key to this. But as, um, as NIE Networks pointed out, you need to look at the planning system as well. Um, that's going to be really key. And I think probably one of the other actions that will come out of the discussion of the micro-inquiry is having to write to a few other committees to try and get some of those things in process. It would be really interesting to get that and um, we're still looking forward to that. Um, Peter, if we could just return to the invest. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I know you were taking notes. We do, we have, a, we have a list. Um, and as I said to yourself during the, the briefing, um, I feel it's really important that the committee gets regular briefings from invest, not just pointed to you know, where the information is, but that we get that information so that we can you know, properly scrutinise that and, and feed into it as well. So, um, that's Chair, what we've done is we, we now have um, a list of all those aspects of what their work was that were raised, and we can now fashion that into a format for a regular briefing. Also, um, I think it, it's probably worth me having another conversation, uh, particularly with Donal, um, just about all the work they're doing. They, they have a lot on there, and we do keep an eye on everything they're publishing. Um, but clearly, there's more happening than we were actually, you know, being kept informed of. It, it's it's a story that I'm always saying to officials: is please tell us the good news. Um, we we rarely get to hear the good news from the department, from the ALBs, and so on. And there's a huge amount of it. Um, so I think in this particular case, I think it was useful for members to see the expanse of the work. Um, where Invest are moving into new areas, where um, Kevin Holland is seeking to innovate um, and, and kind of, if you like, grow and evolve what it is Invest does in response to the, the very changing times we live in. So there's a huge amount there. We will come back on that. The, the other thing, Chair, I wanted to maybe highlight and get a committee steer on was... Um, the issue was discussed about the idea of a lender of last resort. Um, Invest obviously doesn't have that kind of capacity, but it is an issue that's hurtling down the track because of the much, much higher level of indebtedness there is now as a, as a result of the loan schemes and various other things that have, uh, businesses have had to participate in in the, in the last number of months. So I, I don't know if members think it might be worthwhile um, potentially writing to the finance minister with a copy to the um, economy minister of, of whether this is something that can be looked at or is being looked at. It's complex and it's very difficult. Do you think perhaps it's something that we get raised with that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and provide us with some examples of what is yeah. done elsewhere? Yeah. I, I think um, that would be really useful, Chair. And if members are content that we... We act on that, and then once we bring it back, members can, can have a, an idea of what they want to do with it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank Thanks. you. Um, okay, then moving on to item number six, which is matters arising. Um, at 6.1, there is a response from the department on page 90 of your packs in regards to correspondence from a student in Derry attending Oxford University about maintenance loans. 
and members had agreed to forward it to the department for a response. Um, are members content to note and have we provided back to the Yep, we will now once members have seen it. Great. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Moving on then, 6.2, there's a response from Strand Mills University College on page 91 um, in relation to the correspondence that we sent to them about the um, local universities and an update on issues arising from A-level results and COVID-19. Can we ask everybody to put themselves on mute to be better feedback? Thank you. Um, so our members are happy to collate this response with those from the other universities and um, from the students' unions and unions as well. Great. And just to remind members, obviously, of that um, informal meeting that we'll be having tomorrow afternoon with the student unions and UCU. Um, then page 93 of your pack, there is a written briefing um, from the NI Business Brexit Working Group. Um, it's good when it's written out like that. <laughs> the group has submitted a set of questions um, to the British government with regards to the protocol and unanswered questions for businesses here. Obviously, we had our briefings from Professor Katie Hayward and Aidan Conley and um, our Brexit officials on the Internal Market Bill um, over the past few weeks. Um, our members intend to note or have any suggestions. Is that something we have shared with the department? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We don't have all the answers as yet, do we? Mm -hmm. No, no it, it's, um, it's quite interesting in that it's, it's using a really very clever traffic light system <laughs> and a lot of it's red and when you go through it you do have to go through quite a bit before you get some green bits and the green bits are quite small and compared to the red bits and the amber bits. Yeah. Okay, so then 6.4 there is a memo from the clerk at page 3 of your table papers. Um, about plans for our micro inquiries. So, Peter, do you want to yeah. speak to that? Chair, we, we, we've talked about this um, at a few meetings and at the, the strategy session as well. What this uh, memo does is set out what the concept is. So, the, the idea being that we create a system of micro inquiries that will short circuit that very lengthy traditional inquiry process that can take months, even years. So, the idea is. We, we do a first one. This first memo talks about uh, doing one on the macroeconomic picture. Um, and we've managed to get the Venn diagram I, I verbally talked about last week, but now we have it in, in glorious technicolour there, just to, to give members the idea. So at the heart of it is the macroeconomic picture. And then around that are all the other aspects of the remit that comes out of it. And what we'll do is from that first initial micro inquiry, the, the macroeconomic one, we will get highlights and hints for all of the other ones. So it, it won't just be, there's that one, that's it, it's done and dusted. It will lead to further micro inquiries, further specifics for those, and they will in turn lead to others. So it's, it's a very networked sort of thing. So the first one, um, I've talked about delivery in the paper there. So it's, it's using a Zoom app where you have the ability to have all of your participants in a plenary field and then they can go off into um, breakout rooms on the app. So very much like what, we, what we've done here before um, in person and what we've planned is it's probably a, a two hour process end to end. We'll bring in members uh, for the feedback and we'll hopefully record that and um, if, we can, if we can get um, set up with Hansard to transcribe that and that will become part of a report. The idea is the feedback session that members will, will be there for, and that we're probably looking at doing those on Thursdays because uh, we can't interface it with the broadcast system yet. That's something we're hoping to move towards and we would then incorporate it into a committee meeting, but we're looking at Thursdays at the minute. So we're, we're hoping that kind of process for members would last about an hour where they drop in, get the feedback. We then capture that, bring it back to committee um, as quickly as we possibly can. Members talk about it, agree on a motion, and we, we send the motion down to the business office with the idea that you get a, um, an item on the order paper, hopefully within a couple of weeks. So end to end, the whole process shouldn't take more than about three weeks. So the first one, as I say, is this macroeconomic. Um, we're looking at 20 participants because that works well with our breakout rooms and just the timings we're using. And if members go to... Um, the end of that P, uh, paragraph 14, I've put four questions there. Again, four questions lends itself to the time scales we're using. So the round table bit is um, 
an hour. That's 15 minutes for each question. So the questions um, look at identifying the structural and infrastructural deficits in the economy that will need to be um, will need to be worked on over the long term to ensure that we, we aren't basically underperforming because we don't have the structure there. Second one is changes that have been made irreversible because of COVID. How do we work with those and, and, and identify those? Third is measures that need to be taken in the short, medium and long term to support the recovery of the economy. This is something committees talked about a lot before. You know, where, where do we go? It, it's it's as um, Kevin Hall was talking about. You're talking, you know, the next year, the next three years, the next five years, the next ten years, and that's kind of where we need to go because PFG and so on need to be built around that. Um, and then the fourth one is, where are we now in terms of the the, the kind of continuum from COVID hits to, you know, we, we are rebuilding. So we, we've asked them, we, we sort of given them um, phases of survival and stabilising, recovery and rebuilding. So what we're asking is, where are we now, but where should we be? Uh, this is another discussion that, that there's been on the committee is, how do we gauge this? Are we still looking to provide support? Are we still looking to stabilise the economy? Or should we be starting to look at investment, which is, is essentially what... Uh, a lot of the department's bids were about was investment in various aspects of the economy. So it's getting that expertise to try and pin down is where we are, where should we be at this point in the, in the if you like, the, the COVID continuum. So as I say, bringing all that back um, in the feedback session committee is party to that. So we, we, we'll organise time and um, Zoom for members for that. Then back to the committee, discussion, motion, debate in plenary. So the, the idea is we'll provide a body of evidence that will help inform the minister's strategies, will help inform PFG, will help inform other members, will help inform other committees. Um, and this is basically, as I say, the start. The network of other micro-inquiries will feed out from this initial one. Um, and it means we, we can kind of pick up new things as we go along. So I don't want to predetermine what exactly these will all look like, because I think that will become more apparent as we get that information going through this process. So we're, we're working on our technical issues and, and getting our, our participants sorted out. So we're looking at doing the first one on the Thursday, the 5th of November. So that's after the recess. So it's, I think that's the first week back after the recess. So we'll provide more information to members uh, once we've got that all pinned down. But that chair is our basic plan, I hope, um, members were able to follow that, but it is all written down. And if members are content, um, we'll move ahead on that basis, that plan. Yeah. Um, I think uh, yeah, it's a useful um, document, and a useful briefing, and um, I look forward to doing the, the first one. And, and we've discussed with Eddie some ideas for a couple more around remote working yeah. and skills. Yeah. But as you say, the ideas will obviously come out of these as well, and, and members are are free to suggest oh absolutely yeah, yeah so um if people want to feed in ideas um to peter then sure um to do so um are members content with that proposals uh, yes content yep. the only thing is it am or pm so we're probably looking at that's a really good question have we pinned, no we haven't actually pinned that down yet because what we're also going to be doing with the participants is saying what suits mm -hmm. so we're, we're going out to them now Mm. Um, and I appreciate other members. Yes, I'm just thinking about that now. There were the other committees. I'm tied up with justice in the afternoons, but look, if well, you ha I, have to go with it, go with it. Don't but chair, I, I do think maybe morning is probably better anyway for for a lot of the participants. Right, whatever. Um, so we we work we work with members on that because well, the ideal is everybody gets to be there. That's we'll okay. <laughs> Okay, move on with me. to um, 6.5. There's a response from the Infrastructure Minister just um, in relation to the North South Interconnector Planning permission being granted. Um, are members content to note? Great. Um, item number seven then, there's an SL1 Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Schedule 8 Early Termination of Certain Temporary Provisions Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 103 and correspondence from the Dallow at page 104. 
Um, the department proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by paragraph 2.1 of Schedule 8 to the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020. The SR is subject to negative resolution and is hoped to bring it into operation on the 5th of October. The purpose of the SR is to make temporary modifications to corporate insolvency legislation to assist companies affected by the coronavirus pandemic in order to extend periods of certain modifications. Um, so this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the business office. Are members content with the policy direction as outlined? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to item number eight, SR 2020-211, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment of Relevant Period for Meeting of Registered Societies and Credit Unions Regulations NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 109 um, of your pack. Um, there, SR 2020 the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act Amendment of Relevant Periods uh, for Meetings of Registered Societies and Credit Unions Regulations NI 2020 at page 110. There is an explanatory memorandum at page 113. And just for members, there is an error with the came into operation date on the clerk's memo. Um, the correct date came into operation is the 1st of October 2020. Um, the rule is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure. These regulations amend the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 to extend the temporary arrangements for holding certain meetings of credit unions, cooperatives and community uh, benefit societies. These regulations substitute the end date of 30th September 2020 for a new date of 30th of December. Um, and the committee has previously considered the SL1 for this rule and was satisfi satisfied with the policy. Um, and just to advise members, it's subject to confirmatory um, resolution. So are members content with the SR? Great. So the, the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-211, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment of Relevant Period for Meetings of Registered Societies and Credit Unions Regulations NI 2020 and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Okay. Thank you. Just to confirm that that allows for credit unions to have their AGMs virtually? Yes. So, yeah. Chair, it's, it's like the a series of these um, have basically moved on the original proposals and just effectively we're going to see these now for the next number of months, um, allowing the, the, the dates to change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then moving on to yeah. item number nine, there is some documents in your pack in relation to the internal market bill. Um, at page 116, there is um, a, the European Commission letter of formal notice to the UK for breach of its obligations. Um, at page 118, there's a press statement, President von der Leyen, implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Page 119, there is a statement from the European Commission on the extraordinary meeting of the EU-UK Joint Committee. At page 120, there's a press statement from the Vice President on the third meeting of the EU-UK Joint Committee. Um, page 120. Two, there are some frequently asked questions in relation to infringements. And then at page 123 and 137 are the Scottish and sorry, the Welsh and Scottish government um, LCM on the internal market bills respectively. Um, so just to remind members that on the 1st of October, the European Commission obviously formally sent the UK government notice for breach of its obligations with on the withdrawal agreement um, when they did not remove the uh, the clauses in the internal market bill that is going to um, go through the legislative process at the minute. Um, we've obviously had our briefings on the bill, its provisions and its potential impact in relation to the withdrawal agreement and protocol. The clerk has written to the stakeholders already for views in anticipation of any LCM being laid by the minister and a committee report um, being required in respect of that. Um, Peter, do you want to just... Um, Chair, well. it's as, as you say, a number of those documents outline simply the, the EU's process of now moving towards um, an infringement process around the, the fact that the UK internal market bill, as drafted, would infringe on international law around agreements, uh, particularly the uh, withdrawal agreement and the, 
the NI and Ireland Protocol. Um, what we've also included there are the legislative consent memoranda on the Internal Market Bill from the Welsh and Scottish governments. What essentially those are is their reason for not seeking a legislative consent motion. Uh, members will recall we, we talked about this as being part of the process and we'd written to the Minister highlighting this process. So what happens is if a, if a Minister intends to bring a legislative consent motion, they have to bring the memorandum first. That starts a time period for the uh, committee to look at it and then um, the, the, the motion is brought by the Minister and a committee report on the LCM is part of that debate. So that hasn't happened um, for the internal market bill here. Um, as I say, Wales and Scotland have now moved to that point. Their relevant committees are going to go ahead with reports and debates anyway. I think there's a Scottish committee debate today. Um, so it, it's really looking to members to see what you want to do next um, and, and where you might want to go with this, if, if members have any suggestions. I have some uh, suggestions I can make, but. Chair, if we, if we hear if any member suggestions there are first. Um, obviously, the, the Minister referred to this when she was in with us um, a couple of weeks ago um, and that she was taking legal advice and the official says that that legal advice, they've got it now from the Department of Solicitor, but it had to be shared with the executive as well. Um, and I, I think it might be useful just to, um, to share those with the Minister, the, the Scottish and, and Welsh. Um, Positions um, and also, obviously, there are time frames around this that have, have already been breached, that's a um, and it, in relation to the trade bill as well. So that's something we could potentially um, write to the speaker on too. Yeah, chair, absolutely. Um, the, the trade bill is almost timed out now in its Westminster process. So essentially, it means the committee has had no ability to input to that. No legislative consent motion has been brought. No memorandum has been brought to say that's on the way or to explain why it's not been brought. Same for the Internal Market Bill. Um, obviously, that infringes um, on standing orders. Um, I've talked to members before about how the standing orders process works. We've copied the speaker previously in the, the correspondence we sent the minister on the infringement of the standing orders. But as the chair said, it, it may well be now appropriate to formally write to the Speaker highlighting that those standing orders have been infringed um, because effectively, if, if you like, the Speaker owns the standing orders, the, the committee um, has no particular um, ability or role in enforcing those um, and has flagged all this up to the Department. Chair, the other thing I, I wanted to touch on was when the officials briefed the committee uh, last week, they, they referred to, when, when asked about the LCM and why it hadn't been brought, they referred to the fact the bill was being amended. Chair, it's traditional and, and protocol and, and, and procedure to, to bring a legislative consent motion on the bill as drafted, not wait for the amendment process. That allows the committee to be part of that amendment process and is the, the normal way uh, that this is done. Um, if you look at the Welsh and Scottish legislative consent memoranda, they clearly highlight that they are writing on the basis of the bill as drafted, as per the usual procedure. Um, so when officials talked about, you know, the, the bill is changing, there's amendment, that's not strictly relevant to this process. Uh, I just felt it was probably important members were, were aware, aware of that and care on that. So are members content to write to the Minister just to pass on those um, yeah. documents from the Welsh and Scottish um, LCMs and also to write to the Speaker. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number 10, which is correspondence. Um, there is correspondence from the Minister on um, petroleum licence applications at page 168. Um, we had correspondence from concerned members of the public in regards to potential petroleum licence applications. Um, and as you can see, the Minister states she, ha she can confirm no decisions will be taken on whether or not to grant the licences in respect of those applications until the outcome of the review is completed um, and future petroleum licensing regime agreed by the Executive. So are members content to note for now? Great. Yeah, um, 10.2 then, there's a departmental response in terms of public sector transformation fund on ALBs. Um, page 170, at our meeting on the 23rd of September, we considered the response from the DALO regarding the results of the evaluation of the Public Sector Transformation Fund and agreed to ask for a more detailed breakdown across the four years. So, are members content to note for now? Great. Yeah. 
Great. Um, at page um, 171, there's a departmental response priority 10 higher education grant. Um, at the committee's meeting on the 9th of September, we received a briefing from the department on COVID-19 additional funding exercise. Members agreed to ask the department to provide more detail in relation to the reasoning behind priority 10, um, the higher education grant, in relation to the 5% Latin increase. So the department has stated that the additional teaching grant funding for our universities will allow flexibility in offering local students places following an increase in demand as a result of the pandemic. With the cap in place on the student numbers at local universities, it's not possible to increase enrolments without providing additional funding. Uh, and this increase in students' numbers will be primarily directed at STEM-related subjects. So our members content to note. Great. Thank you. At page 173, then, there is a departmental response on the scoring methods for funding bids. Uh, members will remember at the 9th of September meeting, we received a briefing from the department on the additional funding exercise and agreed to ask the department to provide a copy of that matrix in relation to the bids. So our members are content to note. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 10.5 then, NIO, NIAO, sorry, Financial Audit of Invest NI and Media release at page 174 of your PACs. The C and AG wrote to the committee on the 2nd of March in response to concerns raised by the committee about the BBC Spotlight programme on Right Bus. The C and AG has reviewed the issues from that um, in the 2019-20 Financial Audit of Invest NI. And at page 175 is the media release containing the CNAG, containing what the CNAG found. It stated that the CNAG was able to confirm that Invest NI carried out the relevant checks and applied the fund appropriate controls to ensure funding met the requisite criteria of the funding schemes used. Are members content to note? Great, yeah. Um, 10.6 then, there's correspondence from Ruth Corey Harpist on the impact of the new restrictions at page 178 of your PACs. Um, it's about the impact that the new COVID-19 restrictions have on the music sector, leading to on music, sorry, leading to negative impact on that sector, and, and in particular the entertainment um, sector, who have been struggling throughout the pandemic due to the music restrictions. It's led to a drop in income for many um, musicians, and reduced government support could mean it will be a serious struggle for them. Obviously, we've already written to the um, Chancellor in relation to the, the ending of the furlough and also the self-employed income support. Um, perhaps we could forward it on to the Communities Committee as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Chair, I think part of the, the reasoning is the um, uh, members are, 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 are obviously quite clear on, on what exactly a harpist does. Um, and, and this falls under the no live music, and, and it, I have to be honest, Chair, it, it is very hard to understand mm. how someone playing a harp will, will be able to, to spread COVID through any kind of anything. Um, and, and that, in this specific instance, is, is essentially what the regulations are forcing. So someone like um, Ruth Corey would have, would have previously had regular engagements with um, various businesses and so on to play at. And, um, I, I also um, have to say that I, uh, when I was working for the Ombudsman during the hiatus, we used Ruth Corey for a, a, a dinner we were hosting for uh, Ombudsman from around the world, 80 countries, and she was quite a highlight of that um, particular event. So it's, it's the, the rules around this seem to be very complex. I think that might be worthwhile, Chair. Mm. I think that might be worthwhile because we're, we're getting these now increasingly. Yes. Um, where, you know, you're presented with a very clear scenario of how someone actually performs and you're, you're at a bit of a loss as to how that would break rules. So, Chair, if members are content, we'll do that. Yeah, okay. I think that's good. I think these folk are getting tied up with the, the loud music yeah live yeah, music absolutely this is background music it is and, and there's no there's no contact it? there's no physical contact with anyone well, the other it's thing is people shouldn't have to raise their voices to communicate mm. when it's been played while loud exactly. amplified music is is a bit of a risk there'll be no singing along or anything like that I think they're getting you thought. thank so you chair knocked out you know unfairly so i think we we support what you're proposing to do that's good okay thank you um, moving on then to 10.7, there is the 23rd report of the examiner's statutory rules 2019-20 at page 179. 
Are members content to note? Great. Um, at page 189, then, there's correspondence from the DALO to the Clerk for the Committee for Health in regards to the response from the Department to the Committee for Health in relation to concerns about financial support for carers. So are, are members content to note? Great. Yep. At 10.9, then, at page 9 of your table papers, um, there's correspondence from the Department about the lack of apprenticeship places. At our meeting on the 9th of September, the committee considered correspondence from a parent of a construction engineering student and agreed to forward the correspondence to the department for comment. Um, and also on the 4th of September, the minister announced the further details of the three-year apprenticeship initiatives currently in development to take forward support, and that will begin from the 1st of November. So are members content to note? Great. Okay. Moving on then to 10.10, .10, page 12 of table papers, um, correspondence from the department um, in respect of COVID-19 additional funding allocation or ex exercise. Um, the committee received a briefing on the 9th of September and we asked the department to provide a copy of the paper that the minister sent to the executive setting out options for use of the COVID-19 <coughs> support fund underspend um, and they have declined to share that with us which was no great surprise, really. It's, um, it's used as ongoing policy formulation with the executive, so... Um, I yeah. suppose it's something we'll come back to, I'm sure, with the Minister. <laughs> mm. So are members content to note? Great, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. OK, then, page 14 of table papers. There's con correspondence to the Department um, in regards to Invest NI funds for right bus. At our meeting on the 23rd of September, we considered Invest NI's annual report and accounts and agreed to ask what action it has taken to ensure um, proper procedures are in place following the er errors made um, by awarding the funds to Right Bus. So are members content to note that correspondence? Great. Yeah. At page 15 of table papers, then, there is correspondence from the department um, about support for businesses with multiple properties. Um, at our meeting on the 9th of September, members considered correspondence from the Departmental Solicitor's Office to a local or reta retailer regarding support for multiple groups. Members agreed to write to the department to ask whether they're still considering um, specific support for multiples as part of the bids to the executive. Um, are members content to note? Great. Sorry, we missed the action there. 13. Um, there at page 17 of table papers, correspondence from the department about surplus funds from the business support grants. At our meeting on the 8th of July, members discussed the surplus funds not paid. Out on the grants, members agreed to ask the department what bids the minister has made on the surplus funds that were returned um, and how these are being uh, repurposed. And obviously, we've discussed that at length mm. since. So, are members um, content to note? Great, yeah. Um, at page 20 of our table papers, there is correspondence from Causeway Chamber about the job support scheme. Um, our members content to note we've already obviously raised these issues with the, the ministers and the chancellor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So moving on then to page twenty-two of table papers, correspondence from the Commission on a Gender Equal Society um, about creating a caring economy. Um, the correspondence would like to highlight the creation of a gender equal economy within the care sector. Um, are members content to note or have we any um, suggestions? It might be useful to hear from the, the gender um, um, equality group at some point. Sure, we'll, we'll organise an informal with them. Okay. Great. Um, page 24 of Table Papers, then there is correspondence from Renewable NI um, about their rebranding. They had previously been um, NI Renewables Industry Group. Um, so are members content to note? Great, yeah. And then finally, at uh, page 25 of table papers, there is correspondence from the Consumer Council on the annual inquiries and complaints report 2019-20. Are members content to note? Great, yeah. Okay, so moving on then to item 11, our forward work programme. Um, we've discussed some of it already. It's at page 192 of your pack. Are members content to note? Great. Um, any other business then? Um, page 89 of table papers, there is correspondence from the Minister of Finance in regards to support for local newspaper sector. Um, and Gordon, you've asked for this to be... Yeah, yes. I think we, uh, we should raise it up to the Economy Department just to... I'm sure we're all very much aware of it and we've been lobbied about it. 
especially the local newspapers are under big threat. Our local papers have had need to close down for some time during the COVID crisis, so they've got going again, but are finding it difficult. But it's, a, it's a, an issue right across the province, as you are aware of. So yeah. I think we would do well to highlight it up to the economy minister to, for to be considered. Happy to do that, Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, then. So moving on, item 13 is the date, time, and place of our next meeting, which will be next Wednesday in this room and the committee will be briefed by the department on the October monitoring round and apprenticeships and youth training strategy. So thank you very much members. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.